So uh, I'll just start uh, with the Guru Mantra three times. Om Gurave Namah Om Gurave Namah Om Gurave Namah Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Deborah, Satsri, and uh, everybody uh, at PJCOA uh, for organizing uh, this uh, wonderful uh, talks on the Panchanga. And uh, this year, of course, we have started with uh, Tithi, and you've had uh, Satsri uh, doing uh, her Tithi calculations, Guruji has made some presentations on certain foundations of Tithi, and then Visti started uh, the talk on Tithi and marriage. And uh, so once you have heard about the talks on marriage, this is now another aspect that we are going to uh, add today. And today the techniques that I will be discussing are very special because uh, these are uh, techniques which are from our uh, parampara, and uh, so don't ask about sources out here, sources Pandit Sanjay Rat. And but I think when I speak, you will see that things kind of come together and it would make sense to you. So the topic that we have today is a Tithi Lords and the impact on marriage. All right, how does a Tithi Lord impact marriage? Uh, a, do you get married at all? B, or are you denied marriage? or even if you are in marriage, what is the experience of that marriage? We will discuss a few uh, theoretical points and after that, uh, we will be discussing more points as I do horoscopes, okay? And uh, we will take it from there and in the next sessions, uh, we will add some more pointers to what we have discussed today. Om Shing Ring Shing Kamale Kamalada E Prasida Prasida Om Shing Ring Shing Amaharachmi Nama. Okay, so I assume that all of you know the Lordship of the Tithis, right? In the Krishna Paksha and in the Shukla Paksha, they begin with Sun and they kind of end with Rahu. So you would see that Sun to Saturn, which is actually the Vara Chakra. So we have from Pratibha to Saptami, which is Sun to Saturn. And then we have Rahu here in Ashtami. Then again, we have from Navami to Chaturdashi, we have Sun to Venus over here. And then we have Rahu in Amavasya. And then again in Shukla Praksha, the same thing is repeated. The only change that is uh, happening is that when the pakshas are ending in the completion of a paksha in krishna paksha we have rahu as the tithi lord for amavasya and in the shukla paksha we have shani as the tithi lord for purnima all right now since we have rahu involved over here although we are seeing that the tithis are arranged from sun to saturn almost like in a vara chakra order but the vara chakra doesn't have rahu Bara Chakra has seven planets, Sun to Saturn, right? But because Rahu is there, ruling both the Ashtamis, Krishna and Shukla Ashtami, and we have Rahu ruling Amavasya as well. So that means eight Grahas are being involved out here, right? So can we then say that this order is that of the Bara Chakra? No, isn't it? This is not exactly the Bara Chakra order. Although at first glance, when you see the ordering between Sun and Saturn, you would think it is the Vara Chakra order. It is not the Vara Chakra order because of Rahu's presence. So let us see what chakra it is following. Now, this order of the Tithi Lordship is actually based on the Dik Chakra. Dik means direction. All right. Now, why is the Dik Chakra used over here? Now, entering a relation between two people, like if you're talking about marriage specifically, when you're entering a spousal relation, it is based on a direction of life. We will be talking more about it later on. For example, when 
two doctors meet, you would see that doctors really marry each other. They usually meet their spouse during their long tenure of studying. They do their MBBS and then they do their residency. It's a very long period of studying for uh, doctors, uh, but more so doctors than in other disciplines because they are so closeted together in that world of disease and healing and hospitals. They find another mate within that space who also shares the same uh, philosophy or shares the same life they are also a doctor if you see at least uh, you know in the modern era you would see that most doctors have another doctor as a spouse or another person who belongs to the medical field I can say the same for academics people who are uh, professors in a university who are academics who are lecturing I'm talking about serious academics you know who are involved in lecturing, teaching, in perhaps writing books, attending seminars. So again, that's a world which is kind of, they are 24-7 absorbed in that. It is the life of the mind. It is the life of the intellectual. And in such case, they also want a partner who kind of belongs to that same world. So you will see many intellectuals marrying each other because otherwise it becomes very difficult. The moment you have somebody who does not share the path, then the paths go in very different directions. Now, I'm not talking about 100 or 150 or 200 years ago, when wives were, in general, most wives were very uh, content uh, to have a life separate from the husband. Uh, they were very content in looking after the home and the household and the staff of the household and the food and the laundry, even if they were landed. You know, even if they were the aristocrat, they would really look into that and the children, they were quite content because they were brought up to believe that that is the path, that's okay. And the men go outside and they work. So that was kind of an accepted scenario. But I would suggest, uh, I would think that since last, say, uh, 80 years or so, things have changed a lot, isn't it? In the last 78, 80 years or so, things have gradually changed where women are not only are not having only that kind of a household that kind of a role they are also uh, you know academics or doctors or even engineers or doing something so women are more participated they do not have just a restrictive role so in that sense when they are marrying uh, men they would want a partner who would share their lives with them so even in arranged marriages, even in India, when we have arranged marriages, we would like to take a person, if a, if a boy is a doctor, they would like to get another girl who's a doctor. They would think that they would understand each other. You know, doctors sometimes don't even have any, uh, you know, no timings. They can, uh, you know, come, especially in the initial years, they would come back late in the night or they would even go off late in the night, right? You have a wife who's in the medical field and they're constantly in that world. People who are serious doctors are in that world of medicine. Then they would want a partner who shares it. That's a life. They share the same language. Similar for academics. Absolutely involved in the life of the mind. All right, the gati is very different. It's about reading together, sharing intellectual ideas together. That whole world is a very, very uh, a different kind of a life. We can say the same for uh, our astrologers. Uh, people definitely, at least in our paraparas, we are 100% devoted. It's a 24 hour seven thing where we are only uh, thinking and visualizing everything in terms of how the universe is giving signs to us about through the planets, through the rashis, through the nimittas. We are thinking about it, we are reading about it, we are studying on Mantra Shastra, we are studying on the books, we are discussing. We all go through phases of up and down and sometimes people withdraw from this from time to time. But otherwise, there is a, a huge uh, tendency of people to be within the same sphere. So they want a like-minded person. The kind of Jyotish, for example, we do, it is a spiritual Jyotish, so they want a spiritual vibe, especially those who are spiritual. They need somebody also who treads the same path. 
you know, many of you are uh, in our Shiva Mahapuran course, and uh, I was uh, reading some of the messages where people shared their experience of sadhana they are doing. And a couple of them wrote that, uh, you know, their husbands are involved in it, and one of them wrote the husband said they also wanted to do it. So, you know, then if you're doing the sadhana, and another couple of people said that they have a lot of disturbance from the spouse. One student particularly told me that my spouse makes fun of me when I'm doing the sadhana and doesn't understand. So you have a spouse who's making fun of your sadhana, and then you have another spouse who's seeing you and how you evolved and want to be a part of the same journey. If you are doing sadhana, and if your spouse is not supportive, it's very difficult to do this. Many people are spiritual across all religions. They have a small, uh, you know, religion, I mean, maybe the spiritual routine that they do. It doesn't matter whether the husband is a part or not a part of it. But imagine if you're sitting and doing sadhana for, you know, long hours or at least one hour or two, and if you do not have a family member, definitely a spouse at least, who's supporting you in this, then it becomes very difficult. Even if you are not doing sadhana, if you're very spiritual, you want to get initiated from any kind of spiritual tradition and you go to that path and you want to do it. And if you have a spouse who doesn't believe in all this, who makes fun of you, then slowly the paths diverge. Many of you are uh, practicing astrologers and then you would know that many people face this problem. And it's not just uh, limited to the Western countries. This is also true of India. So we are talking, what is this path that we are talking about? We are talking about Gati. Isn't it Gati, the path, the direction that we are going? Direction just doesn't mean that, oh, I'm going to board a plane and I'm going to uh, visit Deborah uh, and uh, Satsri and Tracy in America. And so I'm going westwards. That's not the direction we are talking about. We are talking about direction as a direction of life, as a direction of our soul as well. All right. So some are limited to profession, some are limited to soul. Some people have given up their life and they uh, devote themselves to a lot of charity work. They often go up, they give up their work, they go to the villages. I've seen that in India as well. And they devoted their, imagine if the spouse is not supporting. If a man is giving up, if the wife is not supporting, what happens in all these cases when the marriage is break? Isn't it? You are not just dating. If you are just dating, and if you go in different directions, I believe in the West or in the modern times, you do speak the word, well, you know, we just floated apart, or we just went in different directions, and so our relation didn't sustain. We went in different directions. What does this mean? You know? But when you are marrying, that means you are, you know, making a commitment to each other and you are living together and you are sharing a household, including how the household is to be run, including how many or if at all children you want, how you want to bring up the children. All right. Or, you know, uh, one person can say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a devote, devoted Vaishnav or I'm a Buddhist, or I'm doing Jyotish with uh, DVC or with Parvit Sanjayrath or anybody. And, you know, I've, I've become a vegetarian. And the husband I mean, needs a non-vegetarian meat-based diet maybe three times a day. How do you adjust to that? You can't. It's not a small thing. You just can't adjust. It's not that the husband is saying, it's fine, I support what you're doing, and I encourage you, and I ensure that you always have your vegetarian food. Then that husband is very supportive in your path, maybe knows a bit about your path, all right? But not if they don't understand it. On many grounds, even of what you consider very simple points of this, marriages break. Our paths have separated. Our paths are going different ways. So when this commitment is there, all right, uh, my life is I want to give up my job. And I don't want to stay in Delhi anymore. I want to go to the Himalayas and have a hill over, have a house over there. I just want to do Jyotish and I want to grow some organic fruit and sell and run from that money. That's a different lifestyle. Marriages break when these things happen. Marriages break when people often change also. 
maybe that's the path they wanted all their life inside of them. Then they change and they go in that direction. Many of you, especially in the West, I know, face this. Many of you are doing Jyotish, many of you are doing uh, um, uh, are in the spiritual path, and you may have family members who are not supportive. They don't support because they don't understand or because their path is different. It may so happen that they can change and they understand after a while. All right. That's why uh, in India, we always believe, it, traditionally in India, we always believe that before marriage, it's good for the husband and wife or even immediately after marriage, good for the husband and wife to take diksha together. Now, diksha is a strong word. What I'm saying is in our houses, when you marry, you actually marrying into the family. So then even the matriarch of the family would want the daughter-in-law to take diksha in the tradition of what that family is. So the family <clears throat> ideally follows a certain spiritual path together. They all become followers, say of ISKCON or Krishna consciousness. For example, they all take diksha over there. Even if they don't take diksha, that's the life they follow. Or they are with, say, Ramana Maharishi's tradition, or they are, say, with Achab Devi, with Shishi Ravi Shankar, or they are with Ramakrishna mission, okay, or they are with the Buddhist tradition. So usually the whole family is then involved. You know, I have a, a school friend who went to school with me in my class. Uh, I'm not taking her name out here. Uh, she was, uh, uh, you know, a girl, uh, you know, very beautiful and came from a very good family when she went to school and she had boyfriends and parties and etc. And after marriage, she uh, went to a different city. But her in-laws, they were also a very, uh, you know, good family. But her in-laws, her mother-in-law and everybody in her family were very, very strongly attached and devoted to the art of living. So it is not just the art of living center. They were actively involved. You know, many of them were teachers. They were volunteers, the whole family members. And she as a daughter-in-law got inducted into it. And now she's a very prominent member. She's about my age, obviously. She's a very prominent member in Art of Living. She teaches meditation. And I sometimes know that many of my other batchmates think, oh, what happened? So she took that direction of life of her husband's family, very much integrated. They've got houses near over there, very, very much integrated. You get what I'm saying? Now, these are certain extreme situations, but these do happen. And it's quite common when it happens. Okay, this is what we are talking, a direction of life. Marriage is all about entering a direction of life, a shared direction. Now, if we want to see direction in Jyotish, where do we see direction? Directions are based on the Vik Chakra. All right, directions are based on the Vik Chakra. And here, as you know, largely, Sun to Rahu, the eight planets are fully involved. The eastern direction, which is known as Prachi, is ruled by Sun. The southeastern direction, which is known as the Agnaya Kona, is ruled by Shukra. The southern direction, which is Yamadika, or Yama's direction, is ruled by Mars. Then the southwestern direction, Niritya, the Niritya Kona, is ruled by Rahu. See, Rahu has a role here. The western direction, which is a Varun, Varunya, is ruled by Shani. Northwestern direction, which is the Vayavya Kona, ruled by Chandra. Northern direction, Kubera's direction of money and wealth, ruled by Mercury. And the northeastern direction, known as the Aishanya Kona, ruled by Guru. And Ketu, our Ketu is not in the scene because Ketu is headless, right? He doesn't even have a head. He cannot see. If he cannot see, which way will he go? So it's completely directionless. In Jyotish, we always say Ketu is headless. He's headless, he's directionless, he can't see. So he just goes upwards, Urdhva. Urdhva, he just goes and goes and goes like the great Ananta, like the smoke, he rises. All right, so he's, so Ketu has no direction at all. If we did this table in the form of a diagram with the, in a circular diagram, like a chakra with all the grahas, around, starting from the east on the top, we have all the grahas, and then Ketu is basically in the center of this chakra. And from the center, he's just going up, 
because he can't see the directions are in a material in a plane like this right it's a flat plane the directions with corners in them ketu can't see so ketu is just going up he's absolutely without any direction he's in the center so as you can see that from surya all right to shani including rahu out here these are the grahas the eight grahas which who are also the lords of the tithis so we can say that the tithi chakra or the tithi lordship is based on the dik chakra all right because the tithi lords are giving us a direction of life okay now since ketu doesn't have any direction he doesn't know what is there in front of him so if ketu enters into a relationship what do you think is going to happen because he does not know where to go he just rises upwards and upwards and upwards and he goes directionless and evaporates his smoke he smokes so he just goes upwards he doesn't know all right whereas the other grahas operate as couples all right and these couples are known as natural couples and these couples were based on their profession and work now let's take a, a look at this see the first you can see that we have four couples here and the first couple that we can see are jupiter and venus the next couple is sun and mars then the next couple is moon and mercury and then the next couple is rahu and shani and then the okay these are the four natural couples and in this pairing you can see one graha is male and the other graha is female so for example let's take jupiter and venus they are known as the brahmana grahas all right they are the teachers they are the gurus so jupiter is the male planet out here and uh, shukra is the female planet out here so when i say brahmana it means that the work they are doing is brahmana all right and what is the work that they do which is brahmana like they are either teachers or doctors or astrologers or maybe intellectuals or academics okay so if this is a natural couple if one of a partner is doing brahmana work all right the work is that of a brahmana karma if you are teaching counseling advising or a doctor or a healer or you're a academic or you're an intellectual then all this work is brahmana work so ideally you would choose a person who is also belongs to the same profession are you following what i'm saying because then the gati would be similar and this is natural pairing the next pairing that we have are sun and mars these are the kshatriya grahas where surya is the main male planet and mangal is the female planet okay now this kshatriya grahas they do kshatriya karma so what would you say a kshatriya traditionally kshatriya traditionally is the king the king is supposed to be the kshatriya so a ruler or right a politician an army head uh, if you are in the army Uh, or you are a politician you are like say a mayor or a governor or you are the minister or a prime minister or a president you are holding a portfolio in a cabinet you know uh, you hold some kind of a work in the administration any kind of administrative work any kind of pro uh, protective work because kshatriyas are warriors and rulers any kind of work where you are maybe in the police or the army or a guard or you are a general or a chief all this would come under kshatriya work so with the kshatriya work a uh, similarity of uh, i would say outlook or the path really makes a difference i recently came across a marriage where a girl from a very strong armed forces background married say into a different uh, 
a family which had a different profession and they really did not understand the ethos and values of an armed forces. This person came from a very, very uh, deeply integrated armed forces background, not just her father, but her mother also came from a great background of a lot of people belonging to the army and the navy and things like this. And uh, so their sense of uh, duty, their sense of uh, national pride, it was something that the family she married into did not at all understand or comprehend. So I saw that somewhere there was adjusting, a lot of adjusting was required in that. All right. Next, we come to the natural pairing of Moon and Mercury, where Moon is male and Mercury is female. And this, they follow, Moon and Mercury generally follow a more Vaishya kind of profession. And what is a Vaishya profession? You know, you can either, you're a businessman or you're a trader or you're a, uh, you know, you're probably a stockbroker or you work in the share market, you run a shop, you trade, you know, so many kind of work there is. Then you can also have the, the Shudra category of work, which is ruled by Rahu and Shani, where Rahu is the male and Shani is the female. And they are people who are more in labor-oriented jobs. They can be either cleaners, laborers, domestic staff, people who are serving others. So these are very, very broad category of this. Uh, I would also put the color, the arts, a lot of the arts also come into the uh, Moon Mercury Vaishya category. Okay, that comes in. So these four natural coupling is there. Jupiter, Venus, Sun, Mars, Moon, Mercury, and Rahu, Saturn. And they kind of very broadly uh, denote certain paths that they are following. And what about Ketu? Because Ketu doesn't belong in the Dik Chakra, right? He doesn't have a direction. So Ketu gets married to the Lagna. Okay, Ketu gets married to the Lagna. Lagna is Shunya. So when Ketu gets attached, because whoever Ketu is with, that becomes also Shunya. So what happens when Ketu is married to the Lagna, then either there is no marriage, right? There is no coupling over there. This is because Lagna is Shunya, there is no coupling over there. Lagna is not a Graha. So because there is no coupling over here, Ketu is sing single. And what is the role of Ketu as a single? Ketu is a widow or Ketu is a nun which means either you're a widow or you're an ascetic, one who has renounced. That's why we also say that Ketu is a sadhu. Ketu is a nun or a sadhu or a yogi or an ascetic who has given up, who are not married, all right, and lives the life of a tapasvi or a sadhvi. You know, in, in uh, Christianity, you do have in a certain say that the nuns have to actually marry Christ. So that Christ becomes their, uh, you know, uh, sort of they don't have any other path because their path is Christ. The goal is Christ. So they are marrying Christ. Because who you marry, that is your path. You're sharing. That is the path that you're adopting. Or as I said, you are a widow. Did you follow this? Because all the bodied grahas, including our friend Rahu, are all involved in this. And if Ketu is with Lagna, Lagna is Shunya, then there is no marriage where you are either an ascetic or you are a widow. Okay, now more into that later. Now another very interesting thing over here, that the these that are ruled in our horoscopes, these grahas indicate the kind of people uh, we would like to get married to. So I have Trayodashi Triti, which means the Tithi Lord is Jupiter. Okay, which means that I would like and I would naturally get attracted to people who are following Jupiterian activities, that is Brahmanical activities. So teachers, intellectuals, writers, doctors, astrologers, all those who are cerebral, who are inter intellectual, who are teachers also, you know, uh, they are, they have that, not just an astrologer who's just kind of has a managed matching bureau, no. When I talk about astrologers, I mean those who are also intellectuals and they are writing and teaching, that kind of work, spiritual, okay? So people with, uh, you know, uh, Jupiter rule titties would look for a person who's like that, all right? So that is how the titi matching is happening. We are talking about tithi matching. So this is the fundamental of tithi matching. Why? Because then my gati is going to be similar. I'm looking for somebody 
with a Gati who has Jupiter's Gati. That is the Gati matching. Okay. So at one level, this is the natural coupling. Now the level, the Tithi Lord is showing this. Why am I also interested in this? By profession, am I also that? Yes, by profession, I am also this. By profession, I am also this. I uh, was either an academic or a teacher or a writer or an astrologer, and I'm seeking a like-minded person. All right, and my Tithi Lord is showing that. Now, my spouse's Tithi should also show Okay, what he is looking for. And what if my spouse's Tithi Lord is Mangal, he is looking for somebody who has a lot of Kshatriya qualities. And what does Kshatriya qualities mean? That means he's looking for somebody who can take leadership, who can actually organize things, who can actually lead things, who can be strong and protective. Somebody who be protective of the work the person is doing. So in this way, that matching has to be there. In his mind, if that's what he's looking for, the spouse must exhibit those qualities. The spouse must show those qualities. So even if you are a Brahmana by profession, you should have these Kshatriya qualities in you because the spouse is looking at you to handle a lot of leadership activity. Spouse is looking for a, you see, the Brahmana is the priest or the astrologer. The Kshatriya is the Raja or the Senapati. Raja means the king, the Senapati is the army chief, the captain of the army. And the Brahman is either the priest or the teacher or the tutor now, or the intellectual, the Pandit. So now if he is looking for that quality in you, that means he's expecting you to show qualities of a Rajan. He's expecting you to show qualities of a Senapati of a chieftain, meaning what? That you shall rule and protect. The king protects. King protects all those under him. A ruler of the army, the army chief protects. All right? So that protective quality should be there. So no matter what your, protect, uh, what your profession is in this, you should be having those qualities. Otherwise, your husband is not going to be fully happy with what you're doing. Whatever you do, this is what is expected. So this is a very uh, important rule of Tithi matching. You will need to look into all your uh, Tithi Lordships and then you need to think sometimes, it's very apparent, sometimes that Lordship of Tithi will give you an indication, okay, this is what my husband also wants from me. All right? Now. Let's move to the next section. Let's talk a little bit about Ketu. We talked about those natural couples, the planets, showing us the importance of what the spouses are seeking in each other, showing us about Gati and direction of shared life of shared path, you know, trot together. But what, what would Ketu do over there? Ketu Urdhva Gati, what will Ketu show? Ketu, what is the role of Ketu in this? He is not ruling any Tithi, right? We all know why he's not ruling any Tithi, because he's directionless. Okay. Ketu, we said, is married to Lagna. Lagna is Shunya. And because Lagna is Shunya, it makes Ketu a widow. Or Ketu spared with God, we discussed this. So just the way a nun is married to Christ. So Ketu is either a widow or Ketu is uh, a great yogi or yogini. Here you can see, we have the picture of the great divine mother. Uh, she is a Mahavidya, a goddess. But see the other Mahavidyas and see that Rupas and see this Rupa as shown by Ketu. The Rupa is that of a widow. Okay? The great Dhumavati. Now, what happens when Ketu as a Graha comes into our domain of marriage that we are analyzing? What happens in such a case? So, two things can happen. If the seventh lord is with Ketu, seven houses to do with our marriage, right? So, the seventh lord is to do with Ketu. 
not to do with Ketu. If seventh Lord is with the Ketu, all right, I should have highlighted this word, Yuti Ketu, conjoined Ketu, all right, then the marriage has become Shunya. Because whichever Graha is with Ketu, Ketu makes that Graha Shunya. It has become small, dhum dhum, okay? And now if the Tithi Lord is with Ketu, then that too becomes Shunya. Because Tithi Lord is giving you marriage. In our uh, parampara slang, parampara colloquy, we uh, term Tithi Lord as the water boy. All right? You know that Tithis are part of the Paksha, and the Paksha is ruled by Shukra. And this is all Jalatattva. And Jalatattva is very, very important when marriage and relationships are concerned. And not just marriage, any, ma any relationship whether it is between teacher, student, between a mother and a child, between sisters, brothers, friends. Jala means that the emotions are bonding, the emotions are flowing, it is all connecting, it is all harmonious and beautiful. So Jala is very important. Marriage is one of the most intimate relationships we have, where it is not only about this path, which is shared together, but it is also about love and harmony and passion and sexuality, so many factors together. And without Jalatattva, there is no marriage or no relationship between two couples, right? So Jala is very, very important. Now, we therefore, Tithi Lord, we therefore call the Tithi Lord the water boy because the Tithi Lord is so important in marriage. Till so far, we have always studied that the Tithi Lord, where is the Tithi Lord? Is the Tithi Lord afflicted? If the Tithi Lord is afflicted, Kamba is badly placed or whatever is hammered, then marriage is going to get hammered. We have studied these in broad terms. This we have done. All right. And why were we so concerned with the Tithi Lord? We were so concerned with the Tithi Lord because the Tithi Lord is the carrier of the water. Shukra is the source of all water. The source of water is Shukra. Varuna is Jaladhipati. The ruler of the source of all water is over there. Therefore, the carrier of water is the Tithi Lord. So we jokingly always refer to the Tithi Lord as the water boy because he's the one who's carrying the water. So we know so far from all our past years of studies that if the water boy or Titi Lord is afflicted, then that affects a relationship and marriage. And here we are now focusing and giving a very specific, uh, you know, uh, clause for this, that if the Titi Lord or the water boy is with Ketu, it is Shunya. It is Shunya, it's gone. All right? Shunya means zero, in case you didn't know. So two things we are seeing. If the seventh Lord is with Ketu, marriage becomes Shunya. And if the Tithi Lord is with Ketu, marriage becomes Shunya. What happens when Tithi Lord is with Ketu? Tithi Lord is a water carrier. Ketu will just take it upwards and the water shall evaporate and become small. There will be no water. If there is no water, then there is Shunya marriage. Similarly, seventh Lord, who is seventh Lord? Seventh Lord in any horoscope behaves as if it is Shukra. All right, seventh Lord in any horoscope is like Shukra. So over there again, when it is with Ketu, again, the water of the seventh Lord is getting evaporated. All right, it is getting evaporated and it is getting like smoke and going right up. What do we mean by Shunya? It can mean that either that you do not have any uh, marriage at all, uh, maybe you're a yogi or you're not a yogi, yogi, but you don't get married or your relationships don't work out. Or it just means even inside a marriage, the marriage becomes a shunya. All right. So these are the two things that we will examine. It also happens that death can occur. Some people have a lot of desire for marriage. All right. So they get married. But after that, the spouse dies. So death is then ending the marriage or any kind of death like activity can end the marriage that is the function of ketu ketu is the natural eighth law so what we're going to do is 
slowly now moved towards the horoscopes, all right? And as we study the horoscopes, I will share some more tips and discuss further with you through them. So we are gonna uh, aim is to actually see two extremes that people who became renunciates, so it was total shunya marriage, and also to examine multiple marriages, what happens there. All right. Now the first chart we are going to examine over here is that of Swami Vivekananda. Okay, <laughs> a lot of you uh, know about him. Uh, he was a, a great sadhu, uh, disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. He established uh, the Ramakrishna Mat and Mission in order to continue his Guru's work. He's the uh, translator of the Patanjali, commentator, translator of the Patanjali Sutras, writer of many books, including the famous books on the Raja Yogas and the four yogas of life. Dhanu Lagna with Atma Karata Surya in Lagna. Now, first let's examine what are the principles that we have learned, whether that applies here or not. Now, let us check his tithi. His tithi is Krishna Saptami. Saptami is ruled by Saturn. So our water boy, all right, or Tithi Lord is Saturn. So I'm going to take focus on that graha. Now, is Saturn with the seventh Lord? Seventh Lord is Mercury. No, Saturn is not with seventh Lord. Is Saturn with Ketu? No, Saturn is not with Ketu. Oh, what happened out here? Saturn is not with the seventh Lord. Saturn is not with Ketu, but he did not get married. He became a renunciate. He was a total celibate, a sannyasi, and a very pakka sadhu. So how did this happen? So because it is said that it is not with seventh Lord or Ketu, it can give a desire for marriage. But he did not have a desire for marriage. Uh, let me tell you now a little bit about him. He belonged to a very good family in Calcutta. His father was... Uh, a lawyer and an attorney in the uh, court, in the High Court of Calcutta. Uh, his mother was a very, very spiritual person. He had a lovely big house. Uh, and his mother had was a great devotee of Kashi Vishwana. She has actually built the Kashi, uh, Shiva temple inside the house and she has established the Kashi Vishwana over there. Uh, the government of West Bengal has now made that whole house into a wonderful uh, museum. If any time you do happen to uh, visit Calcutta, take time out and see that place, including the Shiva temple and everything. And he was very well educated. And so uh, while he was studying, a lot of uh, matches came. Now, this word match is a very Indian word. I apologize for that. In earlier days when marriages were only arranged marriages, a proposals would come, all right? So the, what we very colloquially call match. So a lot of proposals or rishta in Hindi as they call it. So a lot of proposals came to his parents because he was such an eligible bachelor, so handsome, so well educated, such a good speaker, so strong. While he was talking, uh, studying, I do have the names also of the people from which families they came, but I did not put that here because that would unnecessarily digress and confuse you all. But people also, you know, lawyers in the high court, judges in the high court, people from a good family backgrounds, they all came to the father. Even when the father passed away, came to the mother, good family friends, very, very eligible daughters. But he was not interested. He from childhood, almost when he was very young, he was into practicing tapasya and meditation. There would be a bale tree in the house. He would be sitting under the tree in his house and he would, get med he would do meditation and he would get lost in meditation, almost like not in samadhi, but totally lost. So his mother and his aunts would all take, you know, like a little bowl of water and they'd put it on his head and say, Shiva, 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 Shiva. Mother would say, what has happened to my son? What has happened to my son? Shiva, 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 wake up, wake up, wake up. Then, of course, you know, while he was studying because of a spiritual quest, he first approached the Brahma Samaj. He was attracted by Raja Ram Mohan Roy's Brahma movement. And the Brahma movement was entirely Upanishadic, 
non-ritualistic, very much go back uh, to the Upanishads, to Advaita philosophy. That's what he was interested in. And then somebody told him, why don't you meet there, this mad priest in Lakshmeshwar Kali temple? And so he went over there. And then, of course, the rest is history. And uh, uh, he became a part of that and got attached to that. And the sadhana and the tapasya and the meditations increased and increased and increased. Now, every time there would be a proposal that would come his way, every time he would run away from the house. He would go to a friend's house and go there and do tapasya, go there and do meditation. And then, you know, his family members, cousins would come and grab him. If you read his life in details, you will see these fantastic uh, episodes and stories. All right. Uh, I've shared a few quotes of his over here. There are many quotes on marriages, which is very interesting. And here, this one says that, why should I marry? When I see in every woman only the Divine Mother, why do I make all these sacrifices to emancipate myself from earthly ties and attachments so that there will be no rebirth for me? When I die, I want to become at once absorbed in the Divine. One with God, I will be a Buddha. So he wants, the, he does not want any rebirth. He wants Ketu, a total moksha. And then there is this very nice one, a monk is not forbidden to marry. But if he takes a wife, she becomes a monk with the same powers and privileges and occupies the same social position as husband. Which is like if, if the wife also becomes a monk, then there is a she monk, right? The, it's a total kind of a celibate kind of a, uh, a relationship. He said that animals don't renunciate, hence animals do not marry. But men renunciate that's why they get married because they have to renounce their chastity and that's why they have to enter into matrimony and another very interesting thing happened you know that he traveled to the u.s where we had a lot of devotees and a lot of uh, of the women both in uk and in the u.s were really really infatuated with him because of his such a striking personality. You can see his Dhanu Lagna with ninth Lord Surya Atma Karaka in Lagna. All right, actually, this horoscope is slightly not wrong. He is kind of Vargottama Dhanu Lagna, I think. But otherwise, what a very, very powerful, agni, fiery personality. When he spoke, all of you know about his great oratorial skill. When he spoke, he spellbound everybody. So women, his devotees, a lot of them became very infatuated. And one American lady devotee came to him and said that I want to marry you because you are so exceptionally intelligent. I want a son who will have this kind of intelligence. So Swamiji thought for a while and then he said that, um, why don't I call you my mother? Why don't you become my mother? Because if you become my mother, then I will become your son. Then immediately you will have me as a child. You don't need to wait and you know deliver another person who will be like me. I will be your son. So you should become like my mother instead. Hearing this, the American lady became totally speechless. She didn't know what to say to that. But you see, this is the way. Anytime he met a woman, he would either treat them as a mother, sister, or a daughter. Much later, when you would have heard of Margaret Noble, uh, the very famous Irish lady who became his disciple and followed him to India, who later became known as Sister Nivedita. Sister Nivedita was also absolutely very much uh, kind of, in, in fact, I mean, people say, well, it was more like a pure infatuation, like if you are really uh, in admiration for your teacher and is speaking of it, then have a kind of infatuation. But Swamiji recognized that this can pose a danger for her. So late when he saw this, he distanced himself after coming back to India. He distanced himself from her on the personal front. So he became very harsh and became more like a very strict teacher with her. And she was upset. And then he told his other guru brothers, I'm doing it for her. That is, I'm very aware of what the uh, things of sannyasa is. And he explained to her as well. He said that, if you have taken the path of renunciation, it's difficult. You're in a different country and thoughts of marriage will come to you. So you must crush that. You must push that aside because this danger is always there. It can happen to me. It can happen to anybody. The thought of wanting to marry and settle down 
can come up in any part of the life. And he said this, particularly because as we see that the water boy, the Tithi Lord Shani is neither conjunct the seventh Lord, uh, I mean Ketu, sorry, is neither conjunct the seventh Lord nor the Tithi Lord Saturn. All right, now we see, what do we have over here? We are seeing that the Tithi Lord is conjunct Chand Eighth Lord. That is the moon over here. Now the Eighth Lord behaves like Ketu, just the way the Seventh Lord behaves like Shukra. The Eighth Lord in any horoscope behaves like Ketu. So when the Tithi Lord is conjunct the Eighth Lord, it is as if it is conjunct Ketu. Are you following what I'm saying? When the Tithi Lord, in this case Shani, is Yuti Eighth Lord, then it is as if it is conjunct Ketu. Moon over there has all the energies of Ketu because he's the Eighth Lord out here. Now the other interesting thing is over here is that of course you can see that this is a Shani Chandra Yoga, this is total Brahmana Yoga, this is a total Vairagya Yoga, right? Shani with Chandra aspecting the Lagna, total Vairagya detachment that you can get. Okay, all those yogas are there. You are Jyotishis, you can look further and further into and see how all this is working out. But we are this not, we are right now trying to understand the impact or the role of Ketu in association with all this. <clears throat> now, that is the reason why we call the eighth Lord of the eighth Bhavada Mangali Asthana, especially in a woman's horoscope, because the eighth house has the capacity to end the marriage. A very, very common dictum in Jyotish, which all of you know, is that if there is any association between the 7th house and 8th house, 7th lot, 8th lot together, 7th lot, 8th lot in each other's house, 7th lot, 8th lot uh, having Drishti, then in such a case what happens, there is a great possibility about the first relationship ending. All right, ending meaning? either through death or through any kind of bad separation or a divorce or whatever ending. Because the Eighth Lord, why, why are we saying this? <clears throat> or many of you or most of you know this dictum, but why do we say this? Why do we say that this is a Mangalya's Thana? Why do we say that association of Seventh and Eighth Lord can end the marriage, perhaps with the death of the spouse or divorce or whatever? Why? Because the Eighth Lord is like Ketu or carries the energy of Ketu. That is why his association with Seventh Lord is bad. And Seventh Lord carries the energy of Shukra. This is the Shukra Ketu Yoga that we are talking about. Hence, now you understand <coughs> why. Uh, so, in fact, when such Yogas are there in the chart of the Seventh Lord and Eighth Lord together, or any kind of association between Seventh Lord and Eighth Lord, we advocate the parihara, the remedy that we are advocating over here is that of Kumbha Vivaha. Whenever we see in a young person's chart, it is there. We are saying they are trying to get married, it's not happening. Or even if they have a boyfriend, we often say, do a Kumbha Vivaha, do a Arka Vivaha before getting married. Meaning so that you've already got married and that marriage is broken. So the, uh, the bad promise of this combination is fulfilled. Now you understand the rule behind it. So here it is the same thing. If Tithi Lord is conjoined Eighth Lord, then that Eighth Lord is like Ketu. So there is, so it has become Shunya. And we can see, as I said, it is in a pure Vairagya Yoga, Shani Chandra, Drishti Lagna, total Vairagya Yoga, total. <clears throat> and what a strong Kalika Yoga uh, that is as well. Then we have the seventh lord. The seventh lord is also not associated with Ketu, but you can see over here that the seventh lord and the second lord, there is a Parivartana. Have you seen that? So by this Parivartana, Mercury has come over here to the tenth house. All right. And because of this Parivartana, since Mercury is here in the tenth house, that means Mercury again becomes associated with the Eighth Lord. See how interesting thing this is. Mercury becomes associated with the Eighth Lord in this yoga. All right, so we can say both the Seventh Lord Mercury and the Tithi Lord Shani are actually having a Ketu influence, 
having an association of Ketu because over the eight Lord Chandra is not really Chandra, but he's Ketu over there. He has made Tithi Lord Shunya, he has made Seventh Lord Shunya. All right, there is a pure Vairagya Yoga of renunciation, of sadhuhood. Okay, Bhratri Karaka over there is sitting. Water Raja Yoga, Water Sadhu Yoga became Maharaj, he's known as Swamiji. He became the head and started Sasha Parampara, which is exists even today, and all of you have heard about it. Okay. <clears throat> Now, let us look at the next chart. This is Abhay Charana Vrinda Bhakti Vedanta Swami, known Prabhupada, better known to all of you as Srila Prabhupada. Very, very, very interesting uh, case. <clears throat> now, here we can see again Tithi Lord is Surya. And is Surya is right here. Surya Tithi Lord is conjunct Ketu. All right, can you see that? And Mercury is here, seventh Lord, but Ketu is not a conjoined Mercury. But Tithi Lord is Surya is conjoined Ketu. Tithi Lord is very strong in its own sign. Hmm? Ketu also in Leo is like its Ucha, very, very powerful. Okay, so when the Tithi Lord is in this Agni Rashi with Ketu, the Agni Tattvas are so, so prominent. Here, because it is attached with Ketu, because there is also the fifth Lord Jupiter out here. If fifth Lord Jupiter was not out here and only San and Ketu were together, he would not have got married. I will just tell you about Prabhupada's marriage and life. But because fifth Lord Jupiter is out here, he will have one marriage and that too, cosmically, it is because of the purpose of having children. Now, let's delve into his life. Otherwise, you will really uh, not understand this uh, horoscope at all. <clears throat> so he got married uh, when he was a student. When he was about 21, 22, he got married and his wife was 11. And he actually says that in those days, everybody got, all girls got married when they were 11 and 12. He said, I have sisters and none of my sisters crossed 12 when they got married. And he said, it's because once they started menstruation, it is believed that, uh, you know, sexual desires come within the girl. So, the, so they should not be, uh, and the boys get sexual desires by the time they are 14 or 15. So girls who are, uh, in uh, about uh, 10 or 11 uh, would be married to boys of 14 or 15. So sometimes the girls are married when they are nine and they are kept uh, with their parents and the moment they have their menstruation starts, they are sent back to their husbands. So it's a very different way of looking at the world, but that is how it was. And Prabhupada, interestingly, takes a lot of time to explain this system to them. And he said that I was married and he said, I did not like my wife. I mean, I have just given you a very truncated uh, quotation, but he goes, he talks in detail. He says, I don't know why. There was no reason, but I did not like her. Okay. He said that she was a very nice girl. She was very faithful, but I didn't like her. So she decided, he decided maybe I should get married again. He thought that, okay, I'm not attracted and I did, you know, maybe I'm not attracted though she's a nice lady, but so maybe I should marry again. And he liked that in those days, under Hindu law, you could take another wife. So he decided to arrange for a marriage, but just before the second marriage could take place, his father, his father was a very, very spiritual man. His father came and said that you are trying to marry again. I request you don't do that. You do not like your wife, that is a great fortune for you. See the quote I've given. He said, you are very fortunate that you do not because he then says that I'm realizing my father's blessings. Yes, that if I would have been too much attached to my wife or I would have got married again, then I would not have come to this position of what I'm doing. And that's a fact. So by ethical point of view and from spiritual point of view, to become too much attached to wife is an impediment for spiritual advancement. All right, so his father didn't let him marry. Prabhupada continued with his uh, 
you know, a duty as a husband. Uh, he begat five children, actually. Uh, people have uh, different, uh, some people say he had three children. He actually had five children. His children grew up, they got married. And he undertook business. So he was a very successful businessman. He had a chemical factory, etc., etc. Later in life, he came in touch with uh, the, the Gorya Vaishnava Sampradaya in West Bengal. Gorya means the Gaur Desha, which is in West Bengal. There's a very, very big Vaishnava culture over there. And his father was kind of involved. His father was also a Krishna devotee. And I'm not getting into the details of how he got involved over there, but he got involved over there, especially from his 40s. And slowly, over the time, he wanted to actually, uh, slowly, kind of, he detached himself. Uh, the nine years of his life, before he became a sadhu, he was a celibate. All right. Then finally, he uh, actually left his family when he was 58. They say that when he was about 48 or 49, the first process started. His business, very interestingly, his business started failing. His business, he has several businesses, all related to chemical and other things. They actually started failing and he was losing money in them. And he was desperately trying to make them work. See how the samsara was actually preparing, you know, from him because if he was caught in the samsara, if he was caught in the work world, then he would not have actually gone in this path. He was so desperate, he opened a new factory in Lucknow, in other cities, but things didn't work out. So finally, I think by 49, he had to actually completely retire and shut shop because there was no way out from all this. And uh, he left his family by the time he was 58. And it's very interesting. <clears throat> Moment Buddha Dasha started. Moment he left his family. He was initiated with them. And then it is said that Keshava Maharaj, who was his sannyasa, Diksha Guru, came into his dream about three or four times repeatedly. And he was beckoning him like this and telling him, come, you need to be a sannyasi. Come to me, you need to be a sannyasi. Come to me, you need to be a sannyasi. And he actually would get agitated when he had these dreams. And he would get up and say that, but I'm not ready. What are they talking about? I have to look after my factory. I have so much of responsibility. But he kept getting these dreams. All right. So dreams often are also, you know, are where the guru is approaching and calling you. Eventually, he did go. And I will talk about why Makuru Dasha. Eventually, he did go. And he got initiated in September 1959 in Mercury Venus. Many of you uh, students who have studied his chart many times, you know the importance of Mercury and Venus as it is in the sixth house from the Arura Lagna. And you know that if Mercury and Venus, that is uh, attachment to karma and attachment to uh, the physical life or the sexual life, if that is in sixth from Arura Lagna, you actually give it up. And this is very prevalent in the charts or horoscopes of many sannyasis, all right? Many, many sannyasis have this uh, combination. So in that sense, we have discussed it many times and we've said how actually Mercury Venus over there uh, represents Radha Krishna. Krishna over there, Mercury being exalted. And we've talked about that quite often. But now see how that Mercury Venus is showing up in this so that he left home moment Mercury Dasha started and he got sannyasa diksha moment Mercury Venus was there. And the interesting thing part was his guru has always told him, uh, that is Bhakti Siddhanta Swami, has always told him that, you know, you are meant, you know, you are an educated boy, you speak English very well, and you have that spark and fire in you, and you are meant to actually go and preach in the world. This is what you're meant to do. And he would, that's how the whole thing, the dream part happened and things like this. So when he got initiated, and he got initiated from Keshav Maharaj, and when he got initiated, he and there were three, four other people, and, and he got initiated as a Tridanda Sanyasi. Tridanda Sanyasi means that you need to actually traverse the whole world. You need to traverse the whole world. You need to go there, and you need to do this work that you're doing. And uh, 
uh, I believe in the sannyasa ceremony after the uh, rituals and all were over, he actually told him Abhay, his name was Abhay Charan De, was his uh, pre-monastic life. And he said, Abhay, why don't you speak to your guru brothers? And he spoke to his guru brothers. So he was initiated into preaching. Bhakti Siddhanta Swami perceived him as that, that this is what he was supposed to do, just the way Vivekananda did. Uh, he was not told by his guru to do it, but Vivekananda had that calling and did it. So the same thing, see both Dhanu Lagna, same thing here, Prabhupada. Prabhupada was not aware of this because he was already in the samsaric world, but he was guided by his guru to do this. And you know that once he did, and he immediately came out abroad and he created this huge uh, ISKCON organization. And you see this yoga that you have over here, this is a temple building yoga. Sun Jupiter yoga, Gopala yoga, many people say, but this is a temple building yoga. If Sun Jupiter came to out here, especially Sun and Jupiter in the ninth house. All right. So we will, we are seeing, what about this Tithi Lord, seventh Lord Mercury? You can see that the seventh Lord Mercury, as I told you, it is the sixth with uh, from uh, uh, Arura Lagna, all right? Uh, and you can see seven is over there, Venus is over there. So he got married. The marriage happened. He was married for a very long period of time, but he didn't know why he was not interested in his wife at all, okay? And he didn't know that he was not interested because Ketu was playing a role out there. So he thought that maybe I took another wife, I would be more interested in that wife. And that's why he had planned to marry her there. Not that he was in love with anybody, but he thought he should have it. And his father had stopped him correctly over there. So you see, he did get married because Seventh Lord is not under Ketu's uh, influence. It is exalted with Shukra, uh, with uh, 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 this... Uh, Dharapada, but because it is in the seventh, a sixth from Arula Lagna, that is the that is the reason why that you would renounce these things, and he renounced it. And so, exactly when that Mercury Dasha came, okay, exactly when Mercury Dasha came, he renounced that Mercury Venus. He got uh, initiated into the Diksha, and in what path Shukra Mercury exalted in the prime Vaishnava Marga, all right, totally in the direction of Vaishnava Marga with Krishna and Radha out there. And you can see that this very powerful yoga out here of almost an Ucha Ketu with a Tithi Lord in its own sign. So because these children had to come, the fifth Lord was here that this happened. And later on, once the children were born and he left, what did the fifth Lord do? Then the fifth Lord was Jupiter. What a beautiful yoga. He did temple building and he gave the Mahamantra. He gave the name of Krishna. He initiated so many thousands of people to the Krishna Nama. What a yoga of, as a Jyotishi we can see, of fifth Lord and ninth Lord over here with Ketu. What a yoga that is, isn't it? What a yoga for spirituality, for mantra, for moksha, right? But as I would repeat and say, because of Jupiter, he underwent that marriage. He didn't become Shuni immediately. And because primarily because Ketu was not involved with the seventh lord. That's why over here the marriage took place. But eventually that also showed its color and he went away and became, you know, such a well-known uh, sannyasi and a sadhu. We are now going to uh, see the chart of one of the Shankaracharyas, Jagat Guru Chandra Shekharendra Saraswati Mahaswami, the, one of the most renowned, considered one of the most spiritual Shankaracharyas ever. All right, let's look at him, his horoscope. Again, Tithi Lord Surya. Hmm? Tithi Lord Surya is with 8th Lord Jupiter. All right. What about the 7th Lord? Because we know they never got married. At a very, very young age, almost by the time they are 7 and 6 and 5 from a tender age, you see they are identified the moment they are born and when they are young, that they are going to be the future Shankara or at least part of the Mark. So at from that young age, they are 
brought over, you know, into the hut and they are grown up in a certain way. That means Ketu has taken over right from the beginning. Right? Ketu was ruling the roost right from the beginning. So marriage should not be there. So Tithi Lord is with the eighth Lord. That much is uh, correct because eighth Lord Jupiter, one eighth Lord is Ketu itself, another eighth Lord is uh, <clears throat> Jupiter. So Jupiter is like Ketu out here. Tithi Lord with eighth Lord, which is like Ketu. Here you can see one seventh Lord is Rahu. And that seventh Lord has gone to the eighth house. Remember what I was telling you about the uh, seventh house, eighth house connection. We know that. So far, so good. But where is Rahu's seventh Lord's association with Ketu? You can see that there is a Parivartana between Jupiter and Venus. And by the Parivartana of Jupiter and Venus, Jupiter is not only with Sun, the Tithi Lord. You can see that by that Parivartana, Rahu as seventh Lord becomes associated with the eighth Lord also with Jupiter. The other seventh Lord Shani is with Ketu who is the eighth Lord. So from whichever angle you are looking, it's a very, very powerful yoga. Look at this. Seventh Lord Shani, eighth Lord Ketu together in Saturn Ketu yoga. All right. What a disaster for samsara, disaster for marriage, disaster for household, but what a tapasri he was. What a great tapasri. You can see his photograph out here. I have given it to you. Considered one of the most spiritual, most highly realized amongst all the later and modern Shankaracharyas. Okay. Chandra Shekhar Saraswati. Of course, you will see so many other yogas. All those yogas are there, right? Shani looking at moon, all those things are there. What a beautiful Shani Ketu yoga in this chart, isn't it? Which is a disaster for any one of us. But how beautiful for him. Abhiwan Rahu, also gone to the eighth house. Excellent. Conjoined the other eighth lord by the Parivartana. And Tithi Lord Surya, though in Big Bala, but conjoined the eighth Lord over there. Absolutely, there is no uh, confusion out here, right? Absolutely no confusion. It is total Shunya. Whichever way you look at it, it's total Shunya. It has to be, isn't it? Otherwise, how would you be taken when you are a child and brought into the mutt and designated uh, to be the uh, Shankaracharya? Okay? <clears throat> Shall we take a look at another chart? Sri Ramakrishna Paramhamsa. Okay, here. Tithi Lord is Chandra, is it? Tithi Lord is Chandra, is born in Shukla Dvitiya. And Tithi Lord Chandra, the water boy Chandra, is in Lagna. Conjoined Seventh Lord Surya. And conjoined eight Lord Mercury. How beautifully happy combination that is. Right? So you can say seventh Lord is conjoined the eighth Lord, which is like Ketu. And you can say the eighth Lord is conjoined the Tithi Lord. Okay? Did you get what I'm saying? This combination that you are seeing out here, you can see that the seventh Lord Surya is conjoined eight Lord Mercury, right? Sun and Mercury. That means, as I told you, eight Lord is like Ketu. Then we are seeing water boy, Tithi Lord, Chandra. Chandra is also conjoined eight Lord Mercury. So they are both Shunya. But Tithi Lord is also conjoined seventh Lord Sunya, Surya. Have you got it? Do you want me to repeat this? That seventh Lord Surya is conjoined eight lord mercury sun mercury yoga or becomes zero tithi lord chandra is conjoined eight lord mercury moon mercury that is also married shunya fine but there is a third combination tithi lord conjoined seventh lord surya sun and moon what does that mean that means marriage will happen yet everything is shunya isn't it you can see of course that there is a, a drishti of uh, jupiter out there so again, just like Prabhupada, he was married when I think 
his uh, when Sri Sharada Devi, Sri Srima was about nine years old and he was also some 12 or 13 or something. She was there in her ancestral home. Then when she came of age and she had to come to his house, hello, he was not there. Where was he? He was a priest in Calcutta. So he was born in this village called Kamar Pukur. It is in West Bengal. He was born there. His father was a priest. And right from his childhood, he was, he led a very spiritual life in the sense that he would, you know, uh, do a lot of, uh, enact uh, what we call jatra, you know, like a folk theater. He would enact stories of Shiva and Ramayana and Mahabharata and where you, he would always assume the role of Shiva and such things. And he would sing and enact and see that strong Mercury and he was so good at it that even, you know, women from very aristocratic families would ask him to come and would ask him that, why don't you do this? He would go into Samadhi and trance even as a small child. All right. So he lost his, and Sharada Devi, his consort, his wife, she came from a, another village called Jairambati. And of course she stayed in the village because she got married when she was nine. Meantime, Sri Ramakrishna's father left his body and he uh, and his elder brother, they both uh, left the village because his elder brother got the job as a priest of a Kali temple in Dakshineshwar, which is like a suburb of Calcutta. All right. So he went there and he uh, became the priest. So Thakur actually was not the priest initially of the Kali temple. It is his eldest brother who was the priest. So because father was not there, so when the eldest brother went, he as a little boy went along with his brother and went over there. And at a very young age, because he was so spiritual, he was completely spiritual, he uh, was appointed first the priest of another temple in that same complex. And what was that temple? It was a Radha Krishna temple. So he was appointed a priest over there, but he spent most of his time in the Kali temple. He would actually be involved in uh, doing the Shingar of Kali, changing her Besha, you know, in a temple, the divine mother, the goddess and the gods, their Beshas get changed and their clothes get changed and things like that. And the same thing happened, right, over here. So uh, the same thing went on with him and he was very totally involved. And of course, he became the priest and he was known as the mad priest of Dakshineshwar because he did so many sadhanas and he became, uh, he followed different paths. He did tantric sadhana in the Totapuri. He did Vaishya sadhana in, uh, uh, in uh, Banaras. He learned a sadhana from a fakir to learn the Islamic, the Sufi tradition. So he was completely the spiritual man. So when the time and the age came for Sharada Devi to come to her husband's house, the husband wasn't there, the husband was there. So she continued staying and they sent a message to him and he said, no, 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 you better stay in your own house. You don't come because, uh, you know, I mean, this is what he was doing. He didn't want a wife for her. So his wife did not even come. After attaining puberty, when the wife was supposed to come, the wife did not even come. Okay. So what happened when the wife did not come? She was there for a... I mean, she just continued to stay in ancestral home. But after she grew much older, she decided that she wanted to join him in the Chinesho because she was spiritual herself. She wanted to say that I will all come. So she came with her, you know, associates. She came to the Chinesho on her own sort of volition at a much later age. And once she came there, then Thakur made a separate house for her, which is known as Inahabad Khana. In Dakshineshwar, in that whole complex, a separate house was made, and that's where she stayed. And she also worshipped and did puja. And Thakur actually uh, worshipped her as the divine mother. Uh, he has worshipped her uh, as Shorashi. So the full puja of Shorashi he has done on her and said that know that she is the divine mother. So that is the only way uh, he could look at her. At another place, she has said, no, that I am Bagala, but he has worshipped her as Shorashi, the full puja of Shorashi Upachar puja 
of Tripura Sundari of Shorashi he has done. And you know, Shorashi of Tripura Sundari is of um, that of continuation of lineages. So of course, there was no cohabitation, there was no uh, you conjugal union, it was out of the question, they lived in separate building, and as you can see that he did not even call her. So you can see when Swamiji later on told, whenever he met women, he made them either their mothers or his sisters or his uh, wives, uh, sorry, sisters or daughters, it is this he has learned from his guru. That you look upon the woman as a mother. That's what the quote also I gave you. He said, when I look upon a woman, I see the mother in her as my mother. So that was the main thing, that all within are mothers. And this is exactly what Thakur also did, Sri Ramakrishna, worshipped his consort. So he did not even get her. So he was married technically because sun and moon is there in the yuti, but he never, she could never come. He never called her over there and she came of her own volition at a much later age. And what he did that she also became like a Guru Patni. She became the Guru Patni. That is what a Guru Ma is. You people call female teachers Guru Ma. This is not what a Guru Ma. This is what a Guru Ma is. She became the Guru Ma. And what happened that all his people like Vivekananda and all the other Swamis and Sadhus, they all... Uh, came to her and she would also guide them and nurture them. She's the one who has advocated all the time that you must do japa. Just do japa, do japa. The more japa you do that you will cleanse. Her quotations on japa is given maximum. And even when uh, Sri Ramakrishna attained a samadhi, even at uh, that juncture, uh, uh, she uh, undertook, well, Vivekananda undertook the external thing of establishing the mud. He would come to her and take her blessings and her permission and discuss things with her all the time. So would all the disciples, including Sister Nivedita. So she assumed that role. All right. So here the Shunna happened and she actually became the Shakti. She was a Shakti. All right. So you can see how this has uh, worked out. Okay. Now, from that extreme, from seeing these uh, beautiful charts of the renunciates, uh, I'm going to take you to another extreme and uh, share a couple of charts of two people who are known to have multiple marriages. But when I'm explaining this, I want to share another technique from the Parampara uh, with you. And uh, this is, you can see, Tithi Lord is Rahu. And Rahu is the seventh lord. The seventh lord itself is the Tithi lord, right? And he had six marriages. There is a little... Died, uh, died, beheaded, uh, uh, sorry, divorced, beheaded, and died, and that's the way it went. Now, now, Rahu is the Tithi Lord. Let's take a look at the other Lord. So we take Shani, who's the co Lord, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, Shani is in Makara in the Rashi chart. And in Navamsha, Shani is in Mithuna. So we are going to count from Makara to Mithuna, which is one, two, three, four, five, six. And he had six marriages. All right. This is another village technique. So we did not take Rahu because Rahu was the Tithi Lord. We took the other Tithi Lord who was Shani, a uh, seventh Lord, which is Shani. And you can see that seventh Lord is also very strong in its own sign. And that Shani is placed in Makara in the Rashi, and it is in Mithuna in the Vamsha, and you count from Makara to Mithuna, and you get six. 
and you can get six marriages over there. So you can get Catherine of Aragon, who was divorced. Then you have Anne Boleyn, who was beheaded. Then you have Jane Seymour, who died. Then Anne of Cleves, again divorced. Catherine Howard, beheaded. And Catherine Parr, who died. All right, so divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, died. Seventh Lord and Titi Lord in Ayush debilitation out there. But, so you can see that there are multiple marriages because the seventh Lord itself is the Titi Lord. All right. I'm going to use this technique to see that in another chart and then I'm going to stop for the day. I was supposed to stop at 6.30 to discuss with you all, but I will take it to the other chart. The other one is Elizabeth Taylor. The both of them are very well-known cases, so I took it. Elizabeth Taylor, Pithi Lord is Shukra. Again, you can see this. The seventh Lord is the Pithi Lord, and she had seven marriages. So because the seventh Lord Venus is the Tithi Lord, we are, and that is exalted, we are not going to take it. We'll take the other Tithi Lord, which is Chandra. Chandra, as you can see, is in Tula Rashi, and in Navamsha, it is Mesha Amsha. So if I count from Tula to Mesha, it is seven. So she had seven marriages. So we can see over here, Conrad Hilton, Michael Wilding, Mike Todd, Eddie Fisher, Richard Burton, John Warner, and Larry Potensky. So though she uh, married and divorced Richard Burton twice, we are considering as one, like he was one person. So there were seven people, seven spouses that she had. All right, all together. So the seven spouses that is there, you can see that the seven spouses are shown in this. So we see that the co-lord, not the, not the lord, which is the Titi lord, which is the other lord, Chandra who is in Tula, and that Chandra is in Mesha Amsha, and we come from Tula to Mesha, and we get seven. And in case of Henry VIII, we did the same thing, and he was married six times, and we got six marriages. There were actual marriages. Okay, so uh, for today, I would like to end and then uh, we'll take your questions and can take some questions here and can also, we will continue our, uh, our discussion of charts and what are the questions you have in the PJCOA Tithi group. All right, so uh, Jai Jagannath, I'm ending today's session here. Over to you, Deborah, she here? Namaste, everybody. And uh, we are going to continue uh, from where we left off last time. All right. So uh, uh, let's uh, do the Guru Mantra three times. Om Gurave Namah. Om Gurave Om Gurave Namah. So, Namaste, everybody. Uh, in the first session, uh, we discussed the importance of the Tithi Lord uh, when it is associated with Ketu, or when the Seventh Lord is associated with Ketu or when the Tithi Lord is associated with the Eighth Lord, because the Eighth Lord is like Ketu. And we saw that in all those cases, uh, Ketu has a Shunya effect on the water. The water evaporates and a marriage becomes problematic. Either there is no marriage or inside the marriage, uh, we feel that it is a much more uh, spiritual or friendly path or there is a lot of huge suffering in it. We ended this discussion and after that, uh, the next section, which was actually allotted to be discussed today, I had just raised the issue and I think I just spoke for five minutes on the counting of marriage. And I believe uh, from what I heard from a couple of you that the screen also had got frozen. So probably that was a nimitta because I was not supposed to start it last class. That session is for today. 
So we will go over that, the rules, and we will go over a lot of charts and the com complexities <coughs> that arises therefrom. And the second thing that I'm going to do is address some questions. So since I did not address questions last time, I'm going to address questions here. So um, I have one or two questions which address certain major areas. So I have incorporated that in my talk. And if there are any more major questions, not like very minor ones, but major ones. So those I will address uh, in the talk today. And any minor ones, we can always discuss it in the forum. So after having talked about marriages going shunya, relationships going shunya, no water, all smoke and fire. And we discuss uh, the horoscopes of very spiritual souls, right? Uh, who though were married, but then left, or who were married and there was no marriage. And some people who had left Sansar since there were a few four or five year old children. So we have examined all of this. Now we're going to examine the other side. And that is what happens when there are multiple marriages. Okay, and in that context, we are going to study the principle of the village technique of counting the number of marriages. So I'm going to straight away go to that section. Okay, so now the basic rule that we did, it's very simple actually. We need to check the Rashi where the seventh lord is placed. And I'm talking about the Rashi chakra, the D1 chart. And then I will need to check the Rashi of this seventh lord in the Navamsha. Okay, so I'm not examining the seventh lord of the Navamsha. My only focus is the seventh lord of the Rashi chart. Which sign is it in D1 and which sign is it in Navamsha? So the sign it is in, in D1, I will call that sign A. And the sign that it is in Navamsha, I will call that sign B. And I will count from A to B. And that number is supposed to give me the number of marriages. All right. Now, there are many uh, factors, riders, modifications to this, which I'm going to go over. So a question comes in, what do we mean by marriages? Marriages, of course, as we count, whether from Upabada, whether, uh, you know, for any other purposes from the Rashi chart, it only includes committed and serious relationships, which should last for at least for the duration of one year. Minimally for the duration of one year, if you seriously like somebody, even though they may not, I mean, you need not have moved in with the person or lived with the person, but you seriously like somebody, you are committed to the person, you really wanted that this relationship should go somewhere, maybe towards a marriage or a commitment if this works out. Perhaps it hasn't worked out beyond a year, well and good. Okay? Sometimes it happens, and this was actually brought up by Deborah, because this works in a horoscope, and she said that though I had X number of relations, which was serious, but I only felt like as if three or four of them were the real relationship. You know, they felt like marriages. So then the number also fitted in over there. Uh, it has happened to another person's chart, you know, a friend's chart I was looking at. And uh, I mean, actually, I was seeing this with uh, Guruji. And uh, that person, has had before she got married, she's had three major relationships. So with marriage, it should be four. But I think in the count, it is showing three. So then he pointed out to me that it's very probably that actually only uh, three of these relationships, all right, two of the three relationships uh, uh, prior to the marriage were actually like a marriage. Maybe one of them was nothing but maybe just a college infatuation. Maybe uh, the person was with the uh, with the spouse for a long time, but the relationship was very spurious. There was nothing much in it. It never felt like a marriage to the person native concern. So though native technically has four marriages, but in reality, it was actually three. And then if you consider parivartanas, it can also get reduced to two. 
So we do have to take this into consideration. Rosemary asked the question of Parivartana. So Rosemary, you will see, I have taken that uh, horoscope example out here where the Parivartana actually is a very important thing. So as I said that this, when you are counting, I've written this line over here, I should have put it in bold, that reflect carefully and decide which are the ones you consider as marriages, all right? Which are the ones? So you can say uh, that, okay, I was with a person for five years or three years, you know, but I, it was really no connection of mind or soul or body. I didn't even feel that it was a marriage. And somehow in your mind, if it wasn't, maybe you are not counting as that. And maybe you had another relationship, which was just for one year. And that was very serious, very committed, very karmic. So that would definitely come. So I hope this is a very important point because I think most of the time I get questions like this. And I think even in the forum, we get questions like this is that, oh, but I had five marriages and four are showing, or I had six major relationships, but five are showing. But then if you think you'll see that that makes sense that actually those five were real. Sometimes, the actual marriages also show up. Okay. The second thing that you must keep in mind over here is your Navamsha. Is your Navamsha rectified? All right. Of course, we are counting Rashi to Rashi. So, in that sense, the Navamsha rectification should not matter so much. But what about you heard Rashi chart? Some people have horoscopes with like uh, with the ascendant degree at one degree something, right? Zero degree something. So this is perhaps a very another tool for you to uh, examine uh, which lagna you are. Many of you have your Rashi lagnas in such minute borders and you're so confused. Uh, doing this rectification is a very huge process because you have to go through uh, all aspects of your uh, life. But this is another tool that you can rectify it with, <clears throat> okay? Uh, what about when we are doing horoscopes of famous people? And many famous people's horoscopes require minor uh, rectifications, especially if the birth time is really at the border, really at the Gandanta, Sandhi of two Lagnas, then definitely this would be a very big help for you to rectify. Okay? So let us go on to the first chart, which I had very briefly uh, you know, glossed over in the last session because, as I said, this topic was reserved for today's session. So, uh, <clears throat> this is Henry the Eighth. Now, you will see that I have taken a few charts, at least five or six charts, all with multiple marriages six marriages, seven marriages, eight marriages, nine marriages. I have taken cases like that. In these cases, I have found that this principle more or less works very well. Okay, in many other cases, you have to be sure of the birth time, you have to be sure of the rect rectification if there are public figures. Okay, if it is, of course, uh, there are horoscopes belonging to you or maybe to your family members where the birth time is more or less known. Okay, but you may have to do some minor rectification, you can look into it. In all these cases that I'm going to put up to you, you would see a very interesting part that in many cases, the Tithi Lord is the seventh Lord, right? What does this mean, the Tithi Lord is the seventh Lord? See, when we were doing the first factor, when we were talking about the Ketu factor, there we were seeing that the Tithi Lord is either associated, or sorry, Yuti. Tithi Lord is Yuti or conjoined Ketu. Or Tithi Lord is Yuti or conjoined Eighth Lord because Eighth Lord we discussed was like Ketu, right? So when this Yuti is there, we are seeing that we are getting a spectrum of marriages which are like no marriages. Thakur Sri Ramakrishna married but did not even call his wife and wife arrived on her own after many years and stayed separately. There was no consummation of marriage over there. Srila Prabhupada married, had a full life and children, but then left everything 
and became a very well known sanyasi and established so many uh, gorya centers all over the world and spread and gave the hare krishna mantra to so many he is known as that all right yet he never knew why he was never attracted to his wife he didn't know so he wanted to marry a second time okay then we have cases like of swami vivekananda of chandra shekhar and saraswati who people never married jagat guru chandra shekhar and saraswati swami girl left his uh, home he was taken from his home at a tender age of probably five or three or seven and taken straight away as a prospective shankaracharya swami vivekananda was in the uh, meditative path right from the beginning and did not get married at all and then there were many other people who discussed who were married but that marriage was held they were married but the marriage was held it was shunya there was no passion there was no physical relationship one of the spouse is very spiritual and as long as the spirituality and physical distance is maintained ketu is happy and the marriage is there or the marriage disappears it's all ketu we are talking about no marriage or even if technically there is a marriage there is really no either consummation of marriage if there is consummation of marriage there is no attraction or beyond the point there is a separation one of the spouse goes in a spiritual path they are friends right we are talking about but here now we are going to talk about people who are married many times six times seven times eight times nine times you will see and here what are we getting that the tithi lord is the same as the seventh lord because if the eighth lord is like ketu then the seventh lord is like shukra isn't it shukra is all jala so tithi lord which is jala when conjoined eighth lord it is becoming uh, like ketu and evaporating and becoming smoke but when it is conjoined seventh lord which is venus like venus then there is more jala and when there is more jala there is more emotion there is more fun there is more uh, bon homie that is going on out there right you will observe it for yourself most of these cases of many number of marriages tithi lord and the seventh lord are almost similar out here okay we have touched upon henry the eighth chart six marriages tithi lord is rahu and you can see rahu is also the seventh lord hence he had so many marriages all right uh and briefly we talked about uh he has uh six recognized uh, wives recognized marriages and uh this is a uh, you know divorced beheaded died divorced beheaded died so catherine of aragon who was from spain who was his first wife catherine of aragon he actually there was a divorce over there there was issue of catholicism and he of course was not a catholic on grounds of that catherine aragon divorced uh and william who was catherine aragon's handmaid and then uh, he had married her and uh, then and Boleyn, of course, uh, went on a different path and had other lovers and other uh, ambitions and Anne Boleyn was beheaded. Then there was Jane Seymour who died, whom he liked very much and died. Then there was Anne of Cleves. Anne of Cleves, he was not attracted to, so they say that marriage was not consummated. It was kind of uh, an all. That was a marriage of, it was a political marriage, all right? Then there was Catherine Howard who was beheaded, and then the last wife was Catherine Parr, and Catherine Parr also died, uh, as far as I know, in maybe in childbirth. So what happens when there is dual lordship? All right, when there is dual lordship, and uh, one of the lords is the Tithi Lord, because many of you have this question, then we take the other lord for counting. Okay, this for counting many of you thought that it applied only when the seventh house had dual lordship but that's not what it applies to all right it is not it is for any seventh lord this principle is for any seventh lord so we can all apply this in our horoscopes and we can check and see whether that works right 
but in cases where there is dual lordship. And in that dual lordship, one of them is the pithy lord. In such a case, we take the other lord. If one of them is not the pithy lord, then of course we will look into both the lords and examine which one gives you the correct answer. In this case, you can see <clears throat> Pithi Lord Rahu is also the seventh Lord. Hence, we will not take Rahu, we will take Shani. And Shani here is in Makara, very strong. Seventh Lord is very, very strong out here. All right, it is in Makara. And in Navamsha, we can see Shani is in Mithuna. Okay, and so if you come from uh, Makara to Mithuna, you get six. That is one, two, three, four, five, six. We get six. So he had six marriages. This is a very, uh, a case which kind of fits in very neatly. Again, there were questions I had from people. Do we count the first sign? Do we count the second? That we count everything. But we have to see, uh, in this case, as we saw, the six, uh, the six marriages works in very well. Now, at, while we are at it, it's very interesting to see the Tithi Lord Rahu, if you can see, it is uh, in Ayush debilitation. So you can see that amongst six wives, only two were divorced and the rest four were either beheaded or they died. So one of those lords is in Ayush debilitation. You must take a note of that. Okay. Now, Let's try and see another chart. Now, this is the chart of Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor's Tithi Lord, as you can see, is Shukra. Krishna Shashti, lorded by Venus. Again, in this case, the seventh Lord is the Tithi Lord. Have you seen people who tend to have more than six marriages between six to nine marriages, the Tithi Lord happens to be the seventh Lord as well. So that means that Jala element is very strong. There is no Ketu element. There is no smoke element out here. The water element is very strong. There is a whole flood. There is a tsunami, is it? Whole flood, too much water. <clears throat> Again, in the same case, if Venus is the Tithi Lord, then I will not take Venus, but I will take Chandra or Moon, because we take Moon to be the co-lord of Taurus. Many of you may not be aware of that. So if you are taking Moon to be the co-lord of Taurus, we can see that Moon is in Tularashi in D1, and in Navamsha, it is in Mesha Amsha, right? So if I count from Tula to Mesha, it comes seven. So seven marriages, yes, as I've given you over here, she has had seven marriages. But there's something that you'll hear. Conrad Hilton, one. Michael Wilding, two. Mike Todd, three. Eddie Fisher, four. Richard Burton, five. John Warner, six. And Larry Potensky, seven. There are seven uh, men that she married. But all of you may or may not know that she married Richard Burton twice. So she first married Richard Burton in 64, divorced him after 10 years in 74, then again married him in 75 and then divorced him again in 76 within a year. So, I mean, here I'm counting this as one. I mean, she divorced him in 74 and within a year or less than a year, she marries him again. I don't think there was probably anybody in between that. And she immediately married him again, probably thought that they had made a mistake in getting divorced. So she marries him again. And so uh, this actually, though legally there was a separation, we are counting this as one. So seven marriages, and again in her horoscope as well, we can see that it fits in seven marriages are very, very clear. Uh, if we want to look at her Tithi Lord and Venus, as you can see, it is uh, exalted out here. All right, and it is with Rahu. What does this association of Venus with Rahu mean? That it means that she has also had affairs while she was uh, in marriage or she has had affairs with people who are married. All right, if you have an affair with somebody who is already married and living with a partner, or if you yourself are living with a partner and you have an affair, then there is a Venus Rahu conjunction over there somewhere. 
it shows up because Rahu is all about crossing the borders. Okay, so in this horoscope also, as we can see that uh, this has worked out. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, these are just extra points to uh, sort of kind of draw your attention to. Uh, you can see that Venus in the, is in the fifth house of love. The fifth house is considered the fifth house of love. So Panchama Shukra. And we can see Chandra has gone to the twelfth house. Now, Chandra per se moon in the twelfth house is not a very good placement. We consider the placement of moon in the sixth house, eighth house and twelfth house to be not desirable, right? For many things, for our health, longevity, for a good life. But whereas we also know that the 12th house, Grahas in the 12th house, uh, the Lord of the 12th house, the, this is, uh, these Grahas can give us marriage. And why does it give us marriage? Because the 12th house is also the nuptial bed. You know, the, uh, the nakshatra, the Bhadrapadas over there, the two nakshatras, they actually show two components of a bed. And that bed can not only be the death bed, and the hospital bed, but it is also the marriage bed. So the bed pleasures and the kind of sexual relationship you have is seen over there. And that is why we often say that if those graha, that is a graha in the 12th house, a graha of the 12th Lord itself, uh, they, that is the priest, that planet is very eager to see that you get married to your partner. So you may meet somebody and you can get attracted to somebody, but you're not marrying that somebody. So Grahas in the 12th house and the 12th Lord are very, very interested to see that you get married. They act like the priest. They are the priest who wants to drag you to the altar. Okay, so many times uh, one gets married during the Antardasha uh, of either, say, Grahas in the 12th house or of the 12th Lord. Now here you can see our 7th Lord moon has gone to the 12th house and it is moon. Moon is, you know, your Jalagraha over there. So these people, these women, uh, you know, whose horoscopes I will be sharing further, they're largely women now I will be sharing. They were all very beautiful, very glamorous. They were all of personalities, okay? Uh, very passionate, uh, very sensual. And, you know, with their kind of pa uh, personality, they uh, just, uh, you know, loved having admirers, loved getting married, and so men were also very much attracted to her. They were divas, all of them, you know? So that Shukra Chandra thing was very powerful. Of course, we also know there's one factor that whenever Venus is exalted, it means that this person is looking for an ideal spouse in either a man's chart or a woman's chart. If Shukra is exalted, it means that you are looking for an ideal partner. Such people also sometimes tend to have multiple relationships because they are looking for the ideal partner. But that's no excuse, all right? Everybody doesn't do that. So Liz Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor, was also very much such a personality, okay? Now, let, let us look at another chart. Now, Zaza Gabor. Zaza Gabor was also a very well-known film actor of Hollywood, and she is really renowned for having nine marriages. So there are some people who had nine marriages, you know. It's not just, I think, she's one of the highest. There's, I think, one or two other people more over there who's uh, married nine times. Now, here we can see the Tithi Lord is Shani. All right, again, you can see Shaktiti Lord is also the seventh Lord. So you can see marriages more than six times. This is the third horoscope we are seeing where the Tithi Lord is also the seventh Lord. Okay, so now if Tithi Lord is the uh, seventh Lord, and here also, just like Liz Taylor, that Graha, Shani, seventh Lord, and Tithi Lord has gone to, seventh Lord has gone to the uh 12th house so we have to take the other lord right and the other lord in this case is rahu now here you can see rahu is in dhanu rashi and in navamsha all right rahu is in scorpio so that means if you are going to count from dhanu to scorpio 
we are getting the number 12 okay but she was married nine times plus there was an affair with the stepson who was the son of one of her spouses so these are like kind of declared 10 relationship but uh, how do we know my question is that maybe there were two other relationships which were very serious and which were like marriages but she didn't get married to them maybe it was there isn't it because if somebody has such a strong uh, yoga for multiple marriages and you know i uh, actually really wanted to share her quotes with you all and she said that i love being married i just love being married i just love having men around me and uh, i love cooking for them so um, it, it's it, she was again also as you can see from the picture very beautiful they were all larger than life personality all very attractive and she says my whole life is about marriages and she just enjoyed it she never get tired now there are people who can hardly deal with one marriage and here she is hopping from marriage to marriage to marriage perfectly happy and uh, perfectly delighted so my point is this is my question and i think so one of her spouses you know you can see the names out here of her marriages that i've got to you here you can see her second marriage was with conrad hull hilton senior conrad hilton was also married to elizabeth taylor all right so now whether it is this conrad hilton senior probably was conrad hilton jr that liz taylor was married to but conrad hilton had a son called nick hilton and apparently uh, Liz Taylor had a sexual relationship with Nick Hilton. So if you uh, count Nick Hilton, we are getting 10 because there are nine marriages plus Nick Hilton, we are 10. And I feel that maybe there were a couple of more marriages over there, maybe very powerful or strong relationships perhaps were there. And uh, in that sense that, uh, you know, uh, which is, which maybe we do not know about okay maybe we do not know about that you can see that rahu is debilitated out here the seventh lord mm -hmm. seventh lord is debilitated in rashi it is an ayush debilitation in navamsha so that seventh lord is uh, does not go very very well but saturn as you can see again has gone to the 12th house and it just conjoined a very powerful moon over there okay very very powerful moon normally those of you who are doing pgc and later on germany also basically what we do is these are very good examples to actually when you are counting marriages learning to count marriages in the chart then you can match with the years and the names and see where it goes but this is the third chart and running that we are seeing that the seventh lord is also the tithi lord now this is another case of uh, nine marriages. This is a, a very beautiful actor called Jennifer O'Neill. Uh, those of you who've seen Summer of 42, she was an actor in Summer of 42. Now her Tithi Lord is Chandra. Okay, Tithi Lord is Chandra. Again, you can see Tithi Lord is Seventh Lord. This is the fourth chart that we are seeing, right? That Tithi Lord and Seventh Lord uh, are the same. And, uh, you know, maybe later on, there are more horoscopes and maybe I can share them with you. So, Tithi Lord and Seventh Lord is the same again. And what we shall do is we shall not take Chandra. We shall take the other Tithi Lord, which is Shukra. Again, you can see Shukra has gone to the fifth house of love. Again, Shukra is exalted out here. So, it is in Meena. And uh, in the Navamsha, it is in Dhanu. Okay. Now, if we come from Meena to Dhanu, we are getting a count of 10. Uh, she had nine marriages, all right? And uh, again, uh, maybe there was one relationship which is very senior, serious, which is not shown. Now, the interesting thing is, she was actually also married to eight men. So, uh, Richard Allen Brown, she married twice, okay? So now if we are taking Richard Allen Brown, also the two marriages, we are getting actually nine. So it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In Liz Taylor's case, it was back to back. Like she divorced, 
Richard Burton, and within a few months, she married him again. Here you can see she divorced Richard Allen Brown in 89, and then in 92, she got married to Neil Bonin, and that marriage was uh, annulled, and then again, she went back to marrying Richard Allen Brown. So there was another relationship in between. You can see how beautiful and glamorous uh, Jennifer O'Neill is. And uh, so we have nine marriages here. And uh, and it, our count says 10. So, you know, it very well could have been there was somebody else, okay, uh, with uh, whom she had a serious relationship. Maybe did not marry uh, on pen and paper. And that's why it is not registered. All right. So you can see here, Venus is exalted in the fifth house and you can see that the uh, Chandra has gone into the eighth. That kind of also shows that breakages of marriages, a lot of divorces, a lot of separation, maybe deaths, those kind of things. Okay. Now, here is another very well-known actor called uh, Mickey Rooney. Now, Mickey Rooney, again, had eight marriages. We can see that the Tithi Lord is Mangal. Here, the Tithi Lord, okay? Here, the Tithi Lord and the Seventh Lord is not the same. But the Tithi Lord is very strong. It is in the 12th house. And it is the 12th Lord in the 12th house. It is Swashetra, so it's pretty strong out there. We have seen that in multiple cases that the Tithi Lord has gone to the 12th house also. So we have to take the 7th Lord as Buddha, Mercury. And Mercury is there in Kanya, in Virgo. And in Navamsha, Mercury is there in Mithuna. Right? Again, we are getting a count of 10. If we come from Virgo to Gemini, we are getting a count of 10. But on pen and paper here, we have about uh, eight marriages. So my question here would be that, you know, these people uh, who are, uh, you know, getting uh, so many marriages, like seven marriages, eight marriages, nine marriages, how are you actually counting? That means you are getting into relationships with so many people. You are actually living with them and uh, having a samsara with so many people. So obviously there may be a couple of, couple of two or three more on the side who you probably had a torrid affair with, but you lived with, probably thought you'd get married to, but it didn't work out. So it's not mentioned here because it was not a legal marriage. So it can be that there were a couple of other serious relationships. All right. And uh, if you want to see the condition of the Tithi Lord, I told you that the Tithi Lord is very well placed in Scorpio. Seventh Lord here, I don't have the degrees here to show you. Seventh Lord here uh, probably may be combust also, for all you know. It is there with Venus, a debilitated Venus, which is doing a Nicha Bhanga too. And it is very powerful. You can see that it is in Kanya Rashi in the Rashi chart and in Mithuna. So it's a very powerful Mercury, and uh, which means that he was a very good actor. If you've seen Mickey Rooney's movie, you will know that he was a very, very good actor. Okay, now, here I decided to also bring forward to you uh, Srila Prabhupada's horoscope. All right. If you look at Srila Prabhupada's horoscope, he was married, right? He was married. He lived with Radharani Devi and he had uh, five children. So, uh, and it was only much, much later that he gave up his job, sold his factories, etc. And that he came back and he uh, became a sannyasi. Now, his Tithi Lord out here is Surya. We had studied how the Tithi Lord is conjoined Ketu. So we are not going to go to that part of the discussion. We will examine his seventh Lord. And we see his seventh Lord is in Virgo. And in Navamsha, his seventh Lord is in Mars. 
So if it is in Virgo and we come from Virgo to Mars, then it comes to eight. So in no way that, uh, you know, this actually matches because he was only married once and he got married, you know, when he was about 20, 21, he was still a student. <clears throat> so, but if you look very carefully, you will see that there is a parivartana between uh, Mars and uh, Mercury. So if there is a parivartana between Mars and Mercury, then Mercury is coming out over here in Mithuna. So you will need to look at these calculations very, very carefully. And you will also need to see the other parts of the chart. In this horoscopes, in what you first need to see, if the Tithi Lord or the Seventh Lord is Yuti Ketu, because then that factor is very strong and is going to override other things. Okay, it is going to override other things because that effect is very powerful. For example, like in Srila Prabhupada's case, it is extremely powerful because it is in the ninth house. The Tithi Lord is the ninth Lord Surya in Sashitra in its own sign. And conjoined, you can see an almost exalted Ketu out there. So the powerful, it is very, very powerful out here. Okay, so this combination has overridden all other combinations. So that is why. Uh, when he married his wife, his wife was very young and he didn't find her attractive. He said there was nothing wrong with her. She was a very faithful lady, but he did not wish to marry her. I mean, he just did not want to, you know, consummate the marriage with her. So he wanted to marry again. And his father said no. So he eventually settled down with her. He had several children with her. He was very caught up with the family business. Eventually the family business went bankrupt and it all became Ketu. It actually, he tried, he really tried and he opened and reopened, um, uh, you know, his factories, but they never worked out. <clears throat> All right. And these factories uh, completely, uh, they became bankrupt and it had to shut up. And much later, of course, he took Diksha, then he got Sanyasa Diksha. All right. And then on to become a full-fledged monastic member and he went abroad and he set up so many centers. So that factor, and I had mentioned to you that this yoga is a temple building yoga. So these factors are very, very, very important. And don't forget that Rahu is also his Atma Karika. Very important. So I would say that this combination really uh, dominates the chart. All right. And also the fact that <clears throat> that this combination, Mercury and Venus, six from Arura Lagna, which is a combination for renouncing. We have discussed all these factors in great detail. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go into that again. But what I'm saying is that this becomes a strong. This comes uh, forward. Okay. <clears throat> so you will need to be very careful when you are doing this counting. So many factors to be taken into consideration. Now, if I look at Thakur Ramakrishna's chart, okay. In Thakur's Ramakrishna's chart, as I explained to you, that he was <clears throat> married when he was very young and his wife was nine. And when the time came for his wife to be sent to him, he said, no, no. No need for her to come because I'm living in a temple and I'm a priest over there in Calcutta. But after many, many years, the wife, when she grew up and was in her 20s, she decided to come. She said, let me go there and I will aid him in his spiritual work. So she came to Calcutta. She also lived in the temple complex, but lived in a complete different uh, building altogether. Okay. But nevertheless, it was a marriage. Now, can we call it a marriage? They never stayed together. There was no consummation of marriage. Are you getting the point? Can we call it a marriage? If you are talking about Parivartana, there is no direct Parivartana between Surya. But you can see that Surya's disposite at Jupiter and Saturn are in Parivartana. Okay, this is the several things that you must keep in mind. Now, there is a, another very uh, uh, important uh, question which was raised by uh, more than two people Excuse me. <clears throat> and this question was that when we discussed about the impact of Ketu 
dry cup, everything becomes a small cup there, everything becomes junior. Two or three people ask me, what is the remedy? Now for this, I need to go a little bit in depth. Of course, it is uh, it would need to be telomere according to a horoscope. But one very primary remedy is that uh, the dichotomy here or the opposition uh -huh, over here is between Shukra and Ketu. All right, Shukra and Ketu is the pair who are opposed to each other. You know, the Rishi has told us that uh, Ketu holds a very high power that he can destroy the Rajas Grahas, Shukra and Buddha. So Shukra and Ketu have this very peculiar relationship. Shuk Ketu is everything that Shukra is not, right? Ketu is everything that Chandra is not. So Shukra is full of water. Her Shukra is beautiful. Shukra loves harmony. Shukra loves marriages. Shukra loves relationships between any people. All Shukra wants is, as Lord of Tula, that everybody should be calm, everybody should be married. He's a Lord of the Seventh House. People should get along with each other very harmoniously. Shukra is Lord of Taurus, would love to wear jewelry. Lord of Tula would love to wear beautiful clothes, uh, have a beautiful uh, marriage, have perhaps more than one marriage, have lots of relationships if if you know the horoscope permits uh likes love and romance and candlelight and passion and shukra so many things ketu is absolutely the opposite if you read parashara you will read the description that ketu wears tattered clothes where shukra loves to wear beautiful clothes have many clothes i have 300 shirts i have 100 shoes i have 200 beautiful dresses they're all beautiful all with beautiful colors i love to dress up ketu is the yogi you know one tattered cloth one you know we have the description that his clothes may be like a uh you know like a Dhabal, you know, like the Anga, you know, like these one piece things that you wear, like a Fedan, and it is composed of uh, patched up material because there is uh, no money and the cloth has gone torn. So I take a bit of cloth from here and there and patch it up and wear it. So the wandering minstrel wears that in many cases we see pictures. That is Ketu. So see everything about Ketu and Shukra. Ketu does not like love or romance or sex or home or husband doesn't like okay basically inertly ketu doesn't like these things so the only way we can really control ketu a very fundamental principle is we need to expand and enhance venus you really need to enhance venus and if you really enhance venus then ketu will go down because there is a tug of war ketu does have the capacity to completely subjugate and control shukra to completely destroy shukra so Shukra has to be very strong that Ketu doesn't do that. So one remedy would definitely be so. Also Shukra is Jalatattva. So we are increasing the Jalatattva. Remember one thing, that blemishes in the horoscope, all right, all kind of problems and blemishes in the horoscope uh, where, where it relates to relationships is a affliction of the uh, water element. It is a jalatattva dosha, it's a jalatattva affliction. So our main remedy is to remedy the jalatattva. Remedy the jalatattva. Moment you remedy the jalatattva, things will become big, very good. Ketu will then not have an upper hand to do anything. So not to, how will you expand the jalatattva? So definitely, you know, you will need to propitiate shukra out there. You need to do shukra mantra. Which shukra mantra will I do? Please, for heaven's sakes, look in your horoscope and see what is the condition of Shukra in your chart and accordingly do a Shukra mantra. Wear clothes uh, which are beautiful, use floral motors, use pretty colors, wear jewelry, do Shingar. Where women are concerned, women, please do Shingar. All right. Um, uh, use perfumes, uh, take care of yourself. All right, go to the salon, take care of yourself, don't hang around with me. Uh, very, very live remedy, I'm telling you. Uh, whenever I, uh, you know, my hair is like that in white, my husband tells me, Guruji tells me, 
that oh no you know ketu is becoming strong too much of gray hair we should really touch up her hair and color it then ketu will be under subjugation when we are discussing this with the family member they don't understand this they just think it's a sign of beautification it is a sign of beautification but it is a sign of beautification the intention is with a remedial purpose that i am keeping my shukra in check i have to sure i dress up properly i dress in a certain way even if i don't want otherwise ketu and later on even shani will become stronger as long as you are doing your shingar where a woman is concerned ketu is shukra is strong all right use perfumes use flowers have flowers in the house so many way and shukra mantra depending on how venus is in the horoscope because there are so many kind of shukra mantras those who have very afflicted venuses venus afflicted by saturn mars rahu ketu then you know they need to go into doing mahavidya mantras like kamala kamala ma mantra uh, you know kamalatmika mantra for that uh, in order to uh, you know really rectify a venus from its uh, afflicted uh, state otherwise if a venus is more or less okay then you know you can do the uh, the, the the mantra that i had Put up right in the beginning of my slide out here. This mantra: Om Shri Ri Shri Kamale Kamala Lai Prasida Prasida. Om Shri Ri Shri Mahalakshmi Nama. Om Shri Ri Shri Kamale Kamala Lai Prasida Prasida. Om Shri Ri Shri Mahalakshmi Nama. Now you know why I put this mantra in the beginning. because last class i was going so much deeply into ketu i said i my it was very scary because when we talk about somebody when we are talking so strongly about grahas we are evoking and activating those grahas and the grahas come into our life so right in the beginning i did my remedy i wonder how many of you noticed it guruji uh, recently uh, whether it was in the shiva mahapuran course or whether it was uh, some other uh, a talk very recently guruji did a lot of talk on mangal and he also you would have noticed had a big small picture of lakshmi and he just quickly said om shri mahalakshmi namaha yes i think it was a shiva mahapuran course webinar where he was talking about the bhairavas and right and he was i'm really not recording he was talking about the bhairavas and it was entirely to do with mangal and he said he said you know my heart shook i'm going to be discussing this so much of mangal so he would put the mahalakshmi picture and very small mantra om shri mahalakshmi nama under his breath he had said om shri mahalakshmi nama went to the slide i wonder how many of you noticed it i said my mantra louder i ensured my venus is afflicted oh god i do not want to take any chances do the remedy do the remedy worship shri mahalakshmi this particular deity that you are seeing on my slide this is padmavati all right padmavati is the consort of uh, venkateshwara who resides in tirupati also known as balaji this is his shakti he is married to her and every friday they have a marriage which is known as symbolic abhishekam known as the uh, shrinivasa padmavati kalyanam so padmavati is actually very strong with durga energy all right padmavati is very durga energy you can see her complexion and uh, if you see why uh, it suits my horoscope because i have shukra conjoined rahu and aspected by <coughs> a shani so uh, that that kind of uh, combination calls for a little bit of a stronger form of mahalakshmi mahalakshmi is durga energy lakshmi is pujagari pure lakshmi shri energy all right so i can do which i did kamalatmika mahavidya so what happens in your rashi chart if your shukra uh, it has the graha drishti or the conjunction of two or more natural manifests like between rahu ketu shani mangal okay and if especially if it is either the eighth lord or the atma karaka you can definitely go ahead and 
just do the Kamalatmika Mantra. Those who are Jyotishis and in the uh, field uh, of uh, doing mantras, and those of you know already, they can even do the sadhana. Otherwise, sadhana is not advised for everybody. The mantra is very, very important. So you can do Om, Aim, Rim, Shim, Tim, Haso, Jagat, Prasutte. So the Jagat, Prasuti mantra can be done already. Otherwise, uh, this form of Padmavati is also a Durga energy. Shukra with any of, of these uh, Planets, natural malefics, you can do this. Om Shrim Vim Shrim Kamale Kamalalaye Prasida Prasida Om Shrim Vim Shrim Mahalakshmi Nama. This is one of the most beautiful mantras for Kamala Lakshmi. Beautiful mantra of Lakshmi. Again, Durga Rupa, very beautiful. This mantra anybody can do when they say Sakshat Lakshmi appears out there. If you can't do, you can just do. Om Shri Mahalakshmi Nama. All right. Those of you cannot do, just do Om Shri Mahalakshmi Nama. But you will need to worship Lakshmi in order to control Ketu. There is absolutely no way out. And it's very beautiful. We are discussing this today on a Friday. Okay. Uh, Venus is said to be really, if we are talking in another aspect, a Mahavidya kind of energy, but in a more direct Devata uh, categorization, Venus represents uh, Lakshmi. Okay. Uh, Venus's Mool Mantra is Shreem. And it is very interesting that Shreem is also the Graha Bija for Chandra. And it is the Mool Mantra for Lakshmi. But then Lakshmi and Chandra uh, actually were born almost together uh, during the churning of the ocean in Samudra Mantana. So Lakshmi uh, is also known as Chandra Sahodari. Sahodari means sibling. So she's the sibling of Chandra. So as sibling of Chandra, her Mool Mantra is Shri. Uh, one, of, one of her main Mool Mantras is Shri. And it is the Grahabija for Chandra also. If you recite, if you do the meditation on Shreem Bija, they say all the malefic, especially those who have been as afflicted by Mars, right? If you have Venus afflicted by Mars, if you have Mars afflicting your seventh house, Mars in seventh house, Mars have uh, Vrishti on seventh house, kind of Mangli kind of doshas, then the <clears throat> very prime remedy or mantra for that would be if you do Shreem Bija meditation. Shreem Bija meditation will completely cleanse the seventh house and it would, it's a very good remedy for Mangal, which is an MKS or any Mangal which is really damaging uh, your uh, Venus. Okay, so the remedy would be to empower Shukra. Uh, as I, and I give you practical lifestyle remedies, the kind of clothes you wear, do shringar, use perfumes, uh, wear jewelry, pay focus on your clothes, buy more clothes, all right? Entertain people, be harmonious in relationships, hold a lunch and dinner party, undam rice, or rice is signified with rice as well, white rice, have white rice, offer white rice, you can do all these things. Flowers, all right, Sugandhim, all this is associated with her. Have much more water element because after all, we are trying to remedy water. You can have, uh, you know, <clears throat> for us uh, in Delhi and uh, in the entire Northern Belt, actually this custom has come from Rajasthan. Rajasthan, as you would know, was a, is a desert area. And Delhi is also a semi-desert area. Now the weather of Delhi has changed because with so much of green tree plantation and things like that, so even when the Mughals came, you know, at that time they would, they had this practice and the Rajas Rajputs also had the practice. They would have these huge pots, these huge brass vessels or, uh, uh, you know, they use metal vessels or you can also have other vessels, huge, massive, filled with water in different parts of the house and they would have rose petals on it and uh, marigold flowers on it, any kind of beautiful flowers on it. This has become, of course, now a trend. So in here, if you go for marriage celebration, marriage is very big in India. In marriage celebrations, you will see these things, but this is the practice. And in Delhi also, this practice is followed a lot. If you go to people's houses, they do it. I also do it because being a very dry, semi-arid region, we are trying to create more moisture and we put water. Now, 
Why I'm saying is that this is translatable also into a Shukra Jalatattva remedy. Have beautiful crystal vases, beautiful crystal vases, and put water in it, put a drop of some perfume in it, and put flowers and petals in it. Do not light a candle on it. This is a little bit of a Jalagan, a Gandanta dosha that happens. So for you all, no candles on it, but you can have this at your entrances, in your sitting rooms, in critical junctures of your uh, houses. All right, it's a very, very beautiful thing. But you must be aware that uh, these uh, uh, water should never get stagnant. That is another remedy. So especially for those of you who do puja, ensure that you're changing the water that is in the Achman Patra that you're offering to the deity. That water must be changed once a day in the morning when you're doing puja. Otherwise, the waters become stagnant. Stagnant water is afflicted shukra. Okay, many people, traditional families, would have very big uh, swimming pools. Uh, we know of a house in Orissa, a huge swimming pool. Huge, it was like Olympic size length and depth, you know. And then, you know, there was water, nobody was using it. The children that the roast, and that water hardly got cleaned or changed. And that was stagnated swimming pool, stagnant water. So no stagnant water. Nowhere should water be stagnated. Water should always flow, always should be uh fresh right no afflictions to jala jala afflictions happen so much at vastu level that is why i'm taking the time out to mentioning this so it's like not just about uh you know chanting the mantras of lakshmi but you must do this vastu correction uh where uh, water jala tattva is concerned you have to remove the affliction to jala tattva nowhere should you have stale water water wherever it's kept in flask uh, near your bedside, in your coffee machine, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, wherever it is, it needs to be changed. Flower vases needs to be changed. All right? These are very, very basic remedies uh, for removing the affliction to water tattva, jala tattva. Because jala is there everywhere in our house. Ensure that in your bathroom, in your kitchen, the water is flowing properly. There are no blockages over there. No sediments over there. We want the water to flow properly. But, and here is my catch to you, that water should not overflow. It should not flood. It should not be a tsunami. Look at Zaza Gabor, tsunami, too much of water. That's why we do not like Chandra in the seventh house. Too much Jala, too much Jala. So you'll have too much of relationships. Jala has to be balanced. All right, Jala has to be balanced. It cannot be less and it cannot be too much that it has created such a wave that it has flooded you, multiple relationships flooded you, that is a wave of tsunami. We do not wish for a tsunami because a tsunami can cause destructions, right? I'm going to take a, 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 some questions now. Uh, let me just open the telegram and... Uh, I need to um, um, all right. Um, Bani, there's also questions in the question. Do you want me to post them into uh, Telegram or? Uh, I can, what, can you oh, see you know, I can't see the questions. I couldn't see it last time either. Okay. Let, um, I can only see your messages, not okay. the audience messages. I don't know why this is. I'm going to paste them in the chat or in the Telegram group for you. Okay, do it in the chat. Let me uh, pause my screen sharing for a second. Yeah, let me, yeah, please uh, put it in the Telegram. Uh, okay, there you go. All right, so there's a question from Pooja Goel who says that what if Tithi Lord is at uh, Rahu Ketu axis? Then also do we consider Shunya? What do you mean Rahu Ketu axis? Uh, Pooja, see, I'm very uh, particular in saying that the 
Tithi Lord should be conjoined Ketu. So if Tithi Lord is conjoined Ketu, it is in the Rahu Ketu axis, isn't it? Uh, did you uh, uh, listen to the first session uh, of the lecture? Because I don't wish to uh, repeat it. I have discussed this in great detail. Those who are born on Amavasya, so if Rahu is at 2A, no, no, Pooja, I think you've not heard the first part of the lecture. Today's talk was just a continuation and finishing the topic and uh, discussing charts and discussing more uh, 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 taking questions. But I think you have not heard. Okay, do listen to the first part of the talk. Your, those questions would be uh, answered. Okay, there you go. Uh, Deborah has given this. Uh, what about the, oh, you have listened to it and you're saying that uh, I will listen again. So if you've listened to it, Pooja, I, uh, we did so many charts last time and I talked about it many times and I said it happens when seventh Lord is conjoined Ketu. So if seventh Lord is conjoined Ketu, that is the principle we were talking, then automatically uh, it's in the Rahu Ketu axis, isn't it? because Rahu is always seven from Ketu. So that's the reason why I didn't quite uh, <clears throat> understand your question. She's typing something in answer. All right, uh, let me uh, see the other questions posted by Maya and we'll come back to it, okay. Um, Nicholas has asked a question, what about seventh Lord being Vargotama? Yes, Nicholas, seventh Lord can be Vargotama. There is uh, no problem with that. Seventh Lord Vargotama is, uh, means that that particular graha is very good. You are asking, does it mean that they will have more relationship? No. Seventh Lord Vargotama doesn't mean you'll have more relationship. It just means that the quality of the planet is very good. All right. Riddhi has asked a question. What if there are two seventh Lords? Uh, yeah. Exactly, Riddhi, I've answered your question. I think that's what we discussed. Uh, Liliana has asked a question, if Venus is exalted and in the sixth from here, is this also multiple marriages? Venus exalted, no conjunction. No, Liliana, you've raised a very, very important question. See, I'm glad because, you know, Deborah, these questions cannot be answered written. Uh, in the last class when I did Srila Prabhupada's horoscope, I gave you this example that from Arura Lagna, the horoscope, the uh, grahas which are there from sixth from Arura Lagna, especially Rajas Guna grahas. Here, let me just uh, share this with you back once more and um, go to Srila Prabhupada's horoscope. Okay, there you go. See what happens. You can see Mercury and Venus is in the sixth from Arura Lagna. Grahas which are there in sixth from Arura Lagna are actually given up, they are renounced. Here, what is being renounced? Mercury and Venus. What is Mercury and Venus? Mercury and Venus are the Rajas Grahas, all right? Here, what is the Rajas that Mercury and Venus are indicating? Venus is indicating love, sex, romance, marriage, right? And Mercury is indicating work, profession, work, job, money, our karma. It is said that when you are taking sannyas, these are the two things primarily that you're giving up. You are giving up your karma. We have people, you know, who have been vice presidents of banks and things like that, who have given up their job and then taken sannyas. You can, you can enter and do karma as a seva while in a mat. In the mat, if today the mat has hospital, a charitable hospital, you are a doctor who's given up your practice and you are in the mud and you are actually uh, doing, uh, working as a doctor from the mud, which is fine. But if you are working as a doctor in a hospital and getting a salary, no, that is you are in a karma bhumi. You are in the karmic land. You're dealing with money, you're earning money and you're having a profession. Similarly, if you're married, then that relationship is there. Uh, even if there is no sex, you may be very close to the person, you may have responsibilities for the person, you can't give it up, but of course, celibacy is a very, very crucial uh, indicator. So Mercury and Venus 6 from Arura Lagna is a very 
uh, accepted a known combination for people who have renounced both love relationship as well as work. So sadhus have this combination. Now, you have asked me what happens if somebody has a Venus in the six from Arura Lagna, a person who's a householder, then that person will have a tendency uh, to be celibate. Will have a tendency to move away from Venus, move away. Say, so even inside a marriage, if such a person is also married, such a person will not indulge too much in romance. Indulge, not indulge too much in passion, not indulge too much in physical beauty. Would want to give it up. They may do it, but will want to give it up. All right? We'll want to want to have nothing to do with it. We'll try to move away. Now, if Shukra is exalted, then that's a double whammy out there. Because I told you that people who have Shukra exalted are actually looking for a very ideal partner. They are looking for somebody who's very, very ideal. So you're looking for God, right? Uh, so if you have, as a woman, Venus exalted in a horoscope, you are looking for God to get married. If you're a man with Venus exalted in your horoscope, you are looking for a goddess to get married. So you're hopping from relationship to relationship because you can't find a goddess. Goddess in every sense. I mean, I just don't mean goddess in looks, but really a goddess with that kind of values. Why? Because Venus in... Pisces, when it gets exalted, Venus is very pure because Venus doesn't want to be fallen. Venus in Kanya or in Virgo is a fallen Shukra. All right. It, it says that almost the extreme is of indulging in prostitution, where it is always wanting to become very pure. And Pisces, then it's like a lotus. Pisces is the ocean or the lake, and it is like a lotus, like the lotus is grown in a swamp, and from the entire mud, the lotus comes up like a tall stem, and the lotus blooms. That's how it blooms in India for us. It grows, it blooms in the mud, in the swamp. So that is the, that mud, that swamp will not touch Venus, because it has gone straight up and bloomed into a lotus. That is exalted Shukra. So they are very pure. So they are seeking purity. Or they want to get married, they are seeking that kind of a person. So now, if you are saying a person has Venus in six from Ail and that too exalted, then the either the person is always seeking for that, is seeking for a pure Shukra. So it will either shun that Shukra or if it shuns the shukra and goes to a, another relationship, then in that relationship, it is actually uh, uh, trying to seek a different kind of a marriage or a different kind of relationship out there. Okay? Where has the question gone? Okay, I hope that answers your question, Liliana. Uh, then Pooja has asked again that if Jupiter aspects on the combination of would be, I didn't talk about aspects. I'm talking about the actual association with Ketu, which make things, everything go poof. All right. Uh, my dear Maya has asked a question, how to count Bargottam a seventh lot of, aha, Maya, very good question. So definitely <clears throat> one would be, of course, it's a single count. That means even if such a person has had many marriages or many relationships, only one would be like what the person considers as a serious marriage or or the other extreme can be number 12. You know, usually when the count is one, we can also take number 12. So keep that in mind. That's why I said you have to be very re reflective and careful. See, when we, I've seen when we often uh, uh, talk about uh, you know, these principles, people often apply those principles very blindly. So that's something you should not, you should take it. So yes, my either one or 12, you know why I'm saying that. Um, Tithi Lord is a nakshatra of Ketu. Okay, let's, let's, I'm not going to avoid that question. Uh, Deborah from Paul Barker, can you please put up the mantra for afflicted Shukra? Okay, I will type those couple of mantras, uh, which everybody can do. Uh, definitely the mantra I put up over there, everybody can do. Also simple mantras like Om Shri Mahalakshmi, Anima, people can do. I will type it out and put it over here. Uh, okay, a question from Sonam. 
installing a fountain, aquarium, or a picture of a river or sea would also be help uh, improve Jalata for very good question, so sort of. Also, preferably in the southeast direction as Venus gets exalted in an era. Okay, Sonam. Two questions, yes. Installing a fountain, beautiful. Fountain is very, very nice. Aquarium, you are also having fishes over there. So that is Ketu, but that's okay. Picture of river or sea, yes. But you need to be very careful that that water in the fountain and aquarium is constantly cleansed and kept clean. You see, moment water is not kept clean, then Shukra gets afflicted. And believe me, amongst everything where Vastu gets affected, Vastu of Jala, Vastu of water is very critical. So first part of the question, yes. Second part of the question, no. Southeast direction is called the Agnia Kona. That is the Agni Kona. That is where we should ideally have our kitchen. A fire lit in the southeast direction is very good. But Jala over there? No, Jala is not good. Jala is good in the northern directions, okay? You have Venus MKS, so you're asking. Venus in MKS, <coughs> uh, you should do Avatara mantras over there. You need to see, have you examined your Tithi Lord? And have you, what is your Tithi Lord anyway? Your Tithi Lord is moon right so you need to examine moon and you have moon here uh, in uh, the ninth house there is the rishti of mangal and there is the rishti of rahu so there is an affliction to your chandra right although it is in swashetra in navamsha so you need to do some remedy for the moon over there moon is also a source of water and if you want to take your seventh laws which is saturn and rahu uh, then uh, Saturn is here with a bunch of planets. You need to look into this a little bit. And it is nature. Your Shani is not that great because it's nature in Navamsha. So that doesn't bode very well. But I think I discussed your chart in the group after the first session. And I told you, which you are not willing to accept, Sonam. Uh, Seventh Lord Rahu has gone to the aid forming a Guru Chandala Yoga. I told you that this itself is the primary problem in the horoscope. All right. You really need to do a remedy for this. And the Janatattva uh, remedies for MKS Shukra? No, not so much. But yes, Shukra is also afflicted by Mangal, but not by either Rahu or Saturn. Okay. But yes, if you want to do a remedy for Venus, because it is a Karaka for the seventh house, definitely you can do it. In addition, you see, in addition, see, Sonam's question on horoscope would be actually very, very interesting in the sense that when she had put up a chart in the group <clears throat> after, you know, the first session that we had, and straight away in her case that I saw, yes, Atithi Lord Chandra is afflicted. It is afflicted by Mangal and Rahu, all right. But you see here, the seventh Lord has gone to the eighth house, which is a very bad combination we discussed. And I told you that that is the Guru Chandala Yoga, the eighth Lord and seventh Lord together in the eighth house is Guru Chandala. Guru Chandala is not at all a good combination. I don't think I would look at anything else in the chart. For me, this is bad enough. So <clears throat> what she should do is definitely, she would need to do mantra and remedies for this. She would also need to do Kumbha Vivaha. Okay. She will need to do a mantra for this Guru Chandala combination. All right. Karaka of seventh house is in Marana Karak Sthana. That is also gone. Okay. So she has all these multiple combinations. Although Venus is very nice in Navamsha in Taurus. So definitely she needs to do a package of remedies. One other seventh or second, not that great. I think it is in some not a very happy nakshatra and is debilitated in Navamsha. Definitely, and the Tithi Lord is afflicted as well. Definitely, she needs to do a serious remedy for her seventh house. I would say mantra for this 
Kumbha Vivaha plus yes, Janatattva rectification as you want to do installing fountain, etc. Picture of river or sea, I would not say sea because sea is more Pisces. We do not want to activate Pisces, but river is nice because river is more associated with the sign Cancer and moon, I think, is your Tithi Lord, right? So I think a picture of a river flowing water is much more beautiful. Don't have a waterfall, but a beautiful, peaceful picture of a flowing river, not ocean. I don't want to go near the Pisces. A fountain, yes. Aquarium, no. Again, it is like a fish. Don't don't go for aquarium. I would say a fountain is a good idea. A picture of a river is a good idea. So now I hope that answers your question. All right. <clears throat> Artem has asked. Um, do people born in Ashtami always face Shunya in lesser or greater scale since Rahu is always opposite to Ketu and has it in Samasaptaka, Rasha Drishti or even in Parivartana? Does Karka also bear? Okay. First question, no, Artem. I talked about Yuti. All right. I talked about a conjunction. So conjunction of Titi Lord with either Ketu or Eighth Lord is giving this Shunya effect. So I did not talk about Drishti. You earlier have tried to put in something to do with Upapada. And so it is affecting your wife. I did not answer those questions because I did not, because that was not a correct question. All right. I did, you cannot transpose that. You have to understand the essence of the point that we are talking about. It is a certain very essential component in your Rashi chart. All right, where your Tithi Lord is behaving in a certain way. Is he able to deliver the water in your chart or not? He's the water boy. And if there is the association with Ketu, the water is getting evaporated. Okay. Second question does cut. So when you said that that is related to Upapa, that it relates to your wife, I said no. Maybe it is in your wife's horoscope, but not because it is in your Upapa. <clears throat> Second question. Does Karka also bear some afflictions in relationship having seventh and eighth Lord as one Raha? I did not understand this question. Okay, Artem, I did not follow it. Maybe you should write and explain what you mean by that. Uh, Deborah is saying that Nicholas still asked this. If you had seven Lord, how do we take that for cow? Nicholas, I replied it to uh, Maya. Maya is a, is a very senior student. So I know Maya would understand what I meant because that answer is related to how we do Narayanasha counting, etc. All right, either one or twelve. Paula asked for Kamalakuna remedy for problems with Shukra but in transliteration. Paula, you know it, isn't it? Um, Akhil, Akhil. Before anything, in every for forum you write my name, you write my name wrong. Every forum. So, Shravani is a very different name from Sarvani. Shravani is from the mouth Shravana. So, from Shravana, it is Sarvani, uh, Shravani. That is a very common name. My name is Sarvani from Sarva, meaning everything, and it is Durga's name. Two absolutely different names, okay? Because you write Shravani in all the forums. So, I'm sorry. Get your mercury rectified. Do you have a mercury issue? So your question is, please suggest what should I look into the chart of before getting married? I'm a yoga practitioner and that's what makes me inclined to relate more. No, no. What if Tithi Lord is also the eighth Lord and Lagna Lord? I could relate to Tiny Nanami. No, okay, please go through the first uh, day stop, all right? because the whole talk about Ketu, it was there. Please listen to it, that entire talk related to Ketu. Then after you listen to it, I will answer your questions in this forum. Okay, because part of your question gets answered over there. Oh yes, Deborah, absolutely. Okay, so she asked the question, let me share more. You know, what happens, we sometimes, even as uh, astrologers, when we are talking, we often shy away from talking about these things. But you see, Shukra remedies, Chandra remedies, are so many other remedies are so much a part of our life. So I do touch up my hair, you know, and uh, I do it because Guruji is very particular about it. And the reason he gives us, he says, no, you know that you are activating Ketu out there, you know, with the white thing. 
So I do, and uh, I get very lazy about it. Okay, about in order to because I have long hair, I need to go to the salon. I can't do it myself. So I get very lazy. So sometimes, you know, when I'm less busy, I'm saying, okay, I have a PGCUA conference. I don't bother when I'm having classes, but when I have a conference, I should do it. I've been too busy. I could not do it. I'm thinking, you know, I'm catching a flight in a few days time. I'm going for a small vacation to Orissa and maybe I should do it. I really have to make an effort to do it. It is an effort. Sometimes, Deborah, when you have Sare Sati going on, you know, Shani will force you to take a bath late, not wanting you to change your clothes, making you want to wear mismatched clothes, you know, green pajamas with, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, with an orange t-shirt, uh, not wanting to comb your hair, not wanting to do shinga, definitely. I'm really telling you, it's a very, it's something I learned through my Sarisati. And I told this to Guruji when he tried it. I said, it's, you have to force yourself to take your bath in time. You have to force yourself to ensure your, you know, your done up properly, whatever way you do up. You don't have to go, out of the way to do something else. But believe me, color your hair, do a little shingar, whatever you like, you know, more or less, uh, you know, uh, take care of your clothes, take care of your, you know, I'm telling you for me, it's a pain, but I do, I make an effort. I really made an effort to match my necklace. It's not easy for me. I make a huge effort because my Venus is heavily con conflicted. And though I've done remedy, I know constantly I need to do remedy to my Venus. I'm really revealing it. When you see me like that, like this, is because it's a remedy. You know, I have to ensure my Venus is okay. So, Deborah, go for it. All for it. I would just tell you. Really, we shy about talking about this, but I'm... We talk so much about Ketu. I'm really telling you that you should need to do this. Okay? Yes, Akhil, as I told you, listen to the first part that we talk. Rosemary has a question. If seventh Lord in Rashi is Shani, but in exchange with Mangal, yes, just like I did with uh, Prabhupada Shah. Do you use original position of Scorpio or Aquarius as counting position? from the Vamsha. Rosemary, does this apply to your chart? If it applies to uh, your chart, maybe, uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure I have your chart. I can take a look at it. Oh, so uh, you are Karka Lagna. Uh, your seventh Lord is Shani. And uh, in Rashi, where is your Saturn? I don't remember. Uh, it's in the fifth house. Is your Saturn in the fifth house in Rashi? If it is in the fifth house, then it'll be four, five, six. It'll be in Scorpio, right? And then where is it in Navamsha? If you can just tell me, Rosemary, where is it in the Rashi and where is it in the Navamsha? I think your Saturn is in uh, there. She's writing. Let me just wait to get her answer. Let me answer Rosemary. I think Rosemary Saturn. She's Katalagna. All right, so her Saturn, I think, is in the fifth house. That means it's in Scorpio. So let us see, but I definitely don't remember where it is in Navamsha. Rosemary, in Navamsha, it is in Leo. Okay, but where is it in uh, Rashi chart? Where is it in the Rashi chart? Quickly, Rosemary, faster. Yes, Rashi in Scorpio. See, I remember you have Saturn in the fifth house. So Rashi is in Scorpio and Nav Navamsha it is in Leo. That's the natal thing. So uh, then if we count from Scorpio to Leo, that becomes 11, right? So now you are saying there is a Parivartana in Navamsha with Surya. So uh, it has gone to Makara. Is it in Makara? Is it in Makara or Kumbha after Parivartana? <coughs> in Aquarius. All right. It is in Aquarius. So you need to, yes, yes, count from Scorpio to Aquarius, 8, 9, 10, 11, 4. I think, Rosemary, I know your number of marriages. I think that works for you, roughly, more or less. 
right? Yes, Deborah, if you really want to improve your Venus, it's hard work, but do it. Oh, my put together is a complete, it's a secret I'm giving away today, is complete, uh, completely a very, very uh, pronounced effort, very pronounced effort on my part. On Guruji's part, it is not a pronounced effort. Guruji is very particular of how he is in public. He has Shukra in Navamsha Lagna. He has Shukra in Kona, in Rashi. His Shukra is very nice. It may be Kambas, but in Navamsha Lagna, it's very nice. So he is very particular. So it's very interesting. I have become a little bit more conscious and particular because of him. Otherwise, I like to be uh, lazy, very lazy, you know? Uh, when I met him, I used to have a little bit more of a Ketu look just out of laziness. So he forced me. I used to wear a Ketu ring. He took it off. He said, your Shukra will get, you know, subjugated. He didn't let me wear a cat's eye. And, uh, and he forced me on this, that to wear brighter colors, wear the jewelry, wear shoes, buy shoes, buy bags. I mean, can you imagine there are women who do that? And I mean, for me, it was enforced on me and it's really a pain when I'm packing my bag and going somewhere. Really, it's a, I'm really, really revealing the private part of my life to you. Huge Venus activity goes on there. Riddhi says, can you explain the meaning of the word Shringar? Okay. Shringar is a Sanskrit word. Shringar is a rasa. You know, there are Sapta rasas. There are seven rasas. Shringar is one rasa. Shringar means love. All right. Uh, so is the love. But Shingar, along with the love, also means the beautification a woman does for her love. So uh, the, uh, the skin care that you do, uh, the makeup that you put, how you do your hair, all right? The jewelry you put, uh, the clothes you put, that is Shingar. But every day after my bath, I'm applying cream to my face. I'm putting kajal in my eyes or coal in my eyes. I'm putting sindoor. I'm putting bindi. I'm putting powder. Maybe I'm putting makeup also. I'm combing my hair, doing my hair. I'm touching perfume. That is Shrikar. For a man, maybe he's combing his hair. He's putting, men also use perfume, putting their perfume, ensure they're properly dressed. That's called Shrikar. Shrikar is, Rosie, that was your question also. Shrikar, yes. Is Shrikar a rasa? So with that is associated with the rasa of love. It's a, it's a very strong uh, Sanskrit word, Shringara rasa, okay? Preeti, just coming out of Vimshotri Ketu Mahadasha of my husband. Oh, interesting line you said, Preeti. Coming out of Vimshotri Ketu, MD of my husband. No, your husband is running of finishing Ketu Mahadasha. So I can relate to all the Shukra talk and the need for it. It needs uplifting at home and yes. Okay, you're welcome, Priti. Uh, Dhumavati worship. See, Vijay, why do you want to do Dhumavati worship? I'm very interested to know this. Why did you ask about Dhumavati worship? Where is Ketu in your chart? Where is Venus in your chart? If you're here right now, quickly type it out. Okay? Sonam, uh, if Bargotama, yes, I replied to uh, uh, Maya, uh, it can be one or it can be 12, okay? See the other parameters. Okay, Vijay, you have Venus and Ketu together in Lagna, and what is your Lagna? <laughs> this question of Venus and Ketu I talked about. See, that's why this discussion was very important. This doesn't come out of the slide. Let me see what his Lagna is. I'm very interested. Mercury, Venus, Ketu in Leo Lagna. Simha Lagna. Wonderful. <laughs> Mercury is your eighth lord, right? Um, Venus and Ketu in Lagna. Ketu is very powerful in Leo Lagna. We consider Ketu to be like, uh, uh, like Ucha. You know, like exalted out there. Venus Ketu over there is, uh, you have to see, I would see that Ketu is more powerful than Venus in this case, okay? And if Ketu is more powerful, then Ketu, if you do not go in Ketu's path, then Ketu causes disruption. That is a single point of view. You either go in my path, what I want you to do, 
be spiritual, meditate, stay away too much from relationships and call with wife or whatever. When I'm happy with you and if you're not doing that, I'll, you know, cause a damaka and smoke everything up. Venus is over there in Lagna. You should, if you are married, uh, you should definitely need to do Shukra remedy. Uh, Shukra, as in Lagna, is a Shubhagraha. Mercury is over there. Maybe you need to do um, Mercury Venus remedy. Okay. Uh, I would be very interested if you put up your horoscope up in the group. You are facing the Venus Ketu that I was talking uh, about to everybody right now. Okay. <coughs> Nita. Uh, okay. Can we relate to? I'm Taurus Lagna, Mars and MKS. God. So Ketu becomes the seventh lord, and my eighth lord Jupiter is the Tithi lord. Mm -hmm. Ketu is dominating the chart, but my Venus is in Digbala and Bargottama. So I'm bringing all the Venus. Yes, 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 Nita. Venus is very important, very important for you. So Vijay, I would love to see your chart. Look at Vijay. We were talking about Venus and Ketu and this Venus and Ketu. So Venus Ketu relationship is very, very interesting. Very. And as I said, Saturn Venus relationship is very different, which when Saturn is strong, uh, Saturn and Venus together with each other, Saturn is a very cold planet. Um, Saturn also does not like physical relationship. Many people with Shani and Shukra together, Shani Shukra in Upapada, Shani in Upapada. You, there is a tendency, there is a coldness that is different. There is not much passion. Uh, either the native or the native spouse, they do not like to have too much of sexual uh, encounters, you know, frigidity, things are frozen. That aspect is there when Saturn and uh, uh, Venus are there together. So, uh, 43 years of marriage, yes, Shukra is in Lagna you've had. But you have had, uh, Vijay, the struggle with Venus and Ketu. See, I don't know your whole horoscope. That's why I said, if you put up, you don't need to give the birth data if you don't want, but you can just put up the picture of the Rashi and Navamsha, then we'll get a very clear picture. Venus in Lagna, Mercury, Digbal and Lagna, Shukra in Lagna is very, very strong, of course. Of course it is, it will show. But what I'm saying is there is a tussle between Venus and Ketu out there. There is. Knowingly or unknowingly, there is a tussle. So don't give your birth data if you don't want, but just put up the picture of the two charts and we can know what it is. <laughs> All right. So what we can do, Deborah, uh, I can end here and then uh, we can take it up the rest and, you know, we can continue the discussion in the group. Uh, is that... Uh, yes, I think that, yeah. I think that's yeah. good. We'll okay. get BJ's chart and answer more questions. Thank you so yeah. much uh, for every everything. Uh, the, these two uh, sessions have been wonderful. Um, full of information and fun informal talk as well, and insights into your life, which is really a special thing. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Uh, it's a pleasure always to uh, speak for PJCOA, and thank you, everybody. Namaste. Namaste.